our conference. Uh, hi, everyone, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear presenters and guests. You are warmly welcome to the online conference Stories on Childhood History, Memory and Research. My name is Ivete Kestere. I am uh, the chair of uh, the organizing committee and represent the University of Latvia uh, and the Latvian Council of Sciences that are founding this uh, conference. Uh, organization of this event uh, got it. Uh, uh, organization of this uh, uh, event went through three stages. First, we intended to organize an old fashioned normal conference in person. Then we switched to a hybrid format, and now we have moved completely online. Of course, the reason for this is unfortunately well known to all uh, of uh, us, the COVID pandemic. Uh, Latvia is in deep lockdown uh, since yesterday until November 15. Uh, but let's find something uh, positive in this uh, unfortunate situation. First of all, we all have met and are lo looking forward to 15 wonderful presentations. Secondly, the online format has let us be more flexible. That is, we are not syn synchronized. Uh, we can drink coffee whenever we want and relax uh, when we want. Of course, uh, this doesn't mean that we will not respect the time limit. However, if a presentation is longer or a discussion is more lively, then let it happen. Uh, our conference is broadcasted uh, through a special YouTube link and the University of Latvia channel. And it, this is very important. I invite our audience to send questions and comments to Padlet. Uh, the link is available on both channels. And Ines uh, will manage uh, the questions and comments. So, at the beginning, we will present our project, uh, which frames the uh, conference. So, I hope uh, you see my uh, screen and uh, everything uh, works uh, well. Uh, so, mm, Uh, so, the idea of the project, mm, representation of childhood at the museums of Latvia integrated in the e-learning environment of higher education, uh, arose in connection with the new educational sciences uh, programs at the University of Latvia. When a greater number of master students began to enroll in the course history uh, of education and philosophy, uh, it, it, this uh, number of students uh, was greater than ever, uh, ever before, about 80 to 100 master students each year. The emphasis uh, in the new program is on research. Uh, which in history means starting with uh, source selection and analysis. Therefore, the question of sources to be offered uh, to student audience become topical. Uh, we, were, uh, we were aware that a wide range of your, uh, objects relating uh, to childhood have been collected in museums of Latvia which perfectly serve to, education, uh, to educate visitors, but have been under-researched. Cooperation between museums and universities was particularly highlighted by the COVID pandemics, when both institutions, museums and universities, were forced to work online with their audiences. To implement our project on cooperation between museums and universities, we formed a great uh, team 
consisting of Mark de Pape, professor emeritus at the University of Leuven and leading researcher at the University of Latvia, postdoctoral uh, student Arne Strasdich, and uh, doctoral student Rain Swainj, as well as master student Inese Resgorin. Arnis and Inese are also employees of Latvian museums. Arnis works at the National History Museum of Latvia, and Inese works at the uh, Railway Museum uh, in Riga. I, Yvette uh, Kestere, have the honor of leading this project. Uh, the aim of our project is to study and map the representation of the history of childhood in Latvian museums and based on the research results to create a database that would activate history uh, research in higher education institutions. Uh, our project uh, raises a number of, of issues to which this conference is dedicated. How is childhood understood in different cultural and political contexts through tangible and intangible heritage? What are typical childhood narratives represented in memory institutions? How can we activate collections of memory institutions in uh, universities? What are the policies and goals of memory institutions for cooperation with universities and research institutions? We will discuss these issues uh, during the uh, conference as we listen to pre uh, presentations uh, from experts uh, from the field of history, history of education and memory institutions. And now we will start with presenting the first results of our uh, project. And now I am giving the uh, floor to uh, Arnis uh, and Ines uh, about the initial results of museum uh, mapping and dat database uh, creation. Please, floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. The primary intention of the project was to carry out mapping of at least 40 different Latvian museums. So far, we have mapped more than a half of them, or 30 museums, including municipal, state, and private museums. And in the map, you can see the geographical variety and geographical expansion of uh, those museums. The different profile of museums mainly determines the diversity of museum collections. On the one hand, a wide variety of collections is considered to be a great advantage in the selection of the object, but at the same time, it makes it difficult to select few of them. Since we have taken a decision to design a database not using an exaggerated number of museum objects, it raises the question of how to conceptually and systematically cover the part of each museum's collections that represent the history of education, especially a history of childhood, in order to design a database model that is transparent, unified and uh, usable, and fit for the research interests of students. Unfortunately, something went wrong with the presentation. me uh, uh yeah yeah yes uh, virtual museums and digitized repositories of museum objects are certainly an aid to the study history of education but none of these resources are specifically designed for research in education sciences therefore our task in design a digital database was challenging our main goal of the project was to deviate from the traditional grouping of objects that are more suitable for historical research and to create a database that corresponds exactly to the research interests of students in the field of educational sciences. In order to identify students' areas of interest, we compiled 883 words from 194 master's thesis defended in the educational sciences at the University, at University of Latvia. Based on this approach, 
the keywords were divided into the following five thematical groups child and political power, child and society, child and institutions, actors, personalities, and pedagogy. According to these five groups, at least 10 objects are selected in each of the museums. This selection will form the basis of the database. But I should say that the current experience has shown uh, that reality differs and sometimes a lot. The material offered by some museums uh, is so extensive that uh, in some cases we have acquired more than 100 digital copies of the objects during the mapping. Each of the five groups are organized on thematical principles and uh, means that the museum objects selected within are diverse and cover extensive groups of objects, from documents, memories and photos, to physical objects uh, as clothing, toys, and even bicycles for children, and safety equipment uh, for driving in cars. Uh, next slide, please. The question, which is as important as the mapping itself, is uh, what kind of stories of childhood discover the objects mapped in museums? The answer to this question allows us to highlight what aspect of history of childhood can reveal the objects and what are they silent about. Objects that are kept in museum collections represent only a small part of the material cultural heritage that gains deeper importance only within a wider context. First result of the mapping allows to say that the chronologically childhood in museum collections is represented from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 1990s. The modern attitude to ch children emerged by the second half of the 19th century. Therefore, the earliest objects that are associated with history of childhood are chronologically more or less related with the development of the concept of modern childhood. However, chronologically, the newest objects come from 1990s, but that makes you ask a provocative question. Do the final decade of the 20th century implicitly mark the disappearance of the childhood? Well, the answer is not ambiguous because the policies of collection often avoid documenting the recent years also called contemporary collecting. Museums occasionally see the events up to date as a less important as they are happening now. Or in other words, uh, it is not a history yet. For example, and it is just one example, museums in their collections have toys from 1990s. We can easily find stuffed toys with images from cartoons, but uh, popular fidget spinners and candom toys have not yet become a unit of museum collections, or um, they are found rarely. But these toys are um, really important um, part of childhood in nowadays. Next slide, please. The understanding of childhood is constructed by adults, or in other, or in other words, uh, by people who have reached maturity. This statement is also confirmed by the first result of museum mapping. The majority of objects described in childhood are, in particular, designed for children by representatives of the adult community, rather than samples of material culture created by children themselves. Um, most of the mapped objects are chronologically related to the Soviet occupation year which lasted uh, in Latvia from the 1940s to 1991. The objects of this time are a part of each of the five main mapping groups. The objects show the impact of Soviet ideology and values on a child as a perfect member of the new community. In addition, with this raises another problem, how to deal with conflicting assessments of the Soviet dictatorship as well as different communities of memory coexisting in Latvia nowadays. Uh, please, next slide. And that means the objects uh, representing childhood during Soviet occupation uh, often carry a variety of feelings, individual connotations, and conflicting uh, contexts. Uh, thank you, Arne. Uh, I will continue.
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in an age of information overload and uh, digitalization, it's clear that knowledge accumulation alone is not enough. It has become a matter of course. It is recognized that value lies in what is done with these resources. So memory institutions are increasingly expected to be active and willing to work with partners in educational, scientific and private sectors. The placement of large amount of digitized cultural heritage materials on the internet does not mean it's whispered us. On the contrary, it meaningful use in other sectors and services must be ensured. As a result of the project, the database created in the internet environment, it itself desires to active such a corporation. Mapping experience show, shows that most museum staff are open-minded and willing to cooperate with researchers. With, with the permission of specialists, digitalization of objects was carried out or digital copies were received from museum storages. Object metadata has also been obtained and if necessarily will be supplemented with needed information to comply with the uh, developed guidelines. After creating an online database model draft, our main goal is clear. It is qualitative metadata that include both a usable digital copies of the objects and the structure and transparency of the data. Uh, it is important that database created for the students and other researchers it is easily uh, understandable. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, the database is based on several principles. Uh, objects are classified according to student research interest, interests. Uh, the digital collection evolve uh, different interpretations. Uh, the objects requires the uh, competencies acquired in course of history of education, such as source critic, uh, source comparison and contextualization. The objects can be used in workshops, workshops uh, both in the history of education and in other study courses of educational sciences. The collection can be supplemented by the students themselves, including digitized history sources that are described according to the database guidelines. guidelines. Because of large quantity of the objects uh, within these thematic uh, divisions, the objects need to be grouped uh, in more detail to make easier for students to navigate between them, perhaps on a chronological basis. But uh, we uh, are still thinking about which principle would be more useful. Uh, and now, Eva and Reynes will talk about first experience for using database in students' audience. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, if a problem-oriented approach is chosen in teaching the history of education, then the starting point is personalization of history which is recognized as permanently important issue in the history studies. Therefore, one of the goals of the study, the study course History and Philosophy of Education is working with the background of current uh, educational problems uh, topical for students. 
During the first lesson in the history of education uh, uh, study course in September 2021, 74 st uh, students of the master's program in educational sciences received the uh, following tasks. First, describe a current educational problem, which could uh, be uh, the topic for master thesis. Write uh, three to five keywords that best describe the educational issue and uh, reveal the childhood uh, discourse, namely five semantic uh, groups of the database. I will continue. As it shows in the graph, most students' research corresponds to the thematic group actors and personalities. 39.3%, which is also represented by students' answers regarding their current educational issue, such as teacher professional activity, teachers' loyalty, attracting new teachers, value of different generations. 35.7% correspond to the thematic group pedagogy. Here students have mentioned such topicalities of education as quality of education in a distance learning process, common values in the learning process, methodical work at school, etc. 17.9% correspond to the thematic group, the child on political power. Here students have mentioned such topical issues of education as pedagogical prestige, pedagogue and administration relations. Next slide, please. The second task was related to already created draft database of historical sources based on their research question. Students had to choose one item from the database and perform source analysis, revealed the creation time place, social political context of the object and identify the source, the maximum of education for time period. Although their research interests overlapped, all students had chosen a different object from the database. Therefore, none of the all objects became the most popular one. Please, next slide. However, the situation was different with the typology. The most often chosen objects for source analysis were various documents. Almost half, 46.3% of all sources studied by students from the database are documents, such as birth certificates, regulations of the cabinet of ministers, documents of the pedagogical process, etc. 20.9% are printed material, textbooks. 25.4% of all objects are photographs of children in educational institutions, classrooms, teachers, and out of school spaces. In terms of the period of history, the most popular became the years of the Soviet dissertation. As it reflected in the graph, 69.6% .6 of all objects are sources chosen by students came from Soviet times. However, it must also be acknowledged that the Soviet period is the most widely represented in the database. As can be seen, 15.9% of objects are created in the interwar period. 10.1% came from the time of World War II, and only 2.9% from the acquisition of Latvia independence from 1991 till 2004. It is clear that students did not use sources before the First World War, as well as sources created during the First World War. So, the data just highlights what Agnes and Inessa already said, that the 1990s in Latvia are the end of history. Working uh, with the database uh, revealed students' skills in source analysis. One of the positive case is a student's work on talented children. The student had uh, chosen a poster from 1981. 
Also, the message of this poster is very narrow. No, uh, no children play with matches. The student has been able to reveal a broader presentation of the Soviet children's life. Namely, she writes, the poster shows the core values of the time. Life is full of positivity. Children have many opportunities to develop their talents and hobbies. In turn, inaction is dangerous. Inaction undermines the ideal activities that exist in the collective. The colors used in the poster deliberately draw attention to behavior that are different and do not fit in. The student has also collected specific information about the author of the poster and used additional literature and the study of visual sources. But of course, the, uh, not everything is perfect. The same student admitted that I look at the source available in the database, but I can't really find anything related to gifted children. Maybe I need to uh, look at the sources in a different context. Therefore, some uh, considerations for our uh, further work are following. Coding of stu student research interests needs to be further considered. How transfer keywords and research questions from the context or perspective of educals, uh, educational sciences to the context perspective of history more efficiently? Secondly, uh, unattractive objects in museum collections, such as educational policy documents and statistics, uh, uh, are much more useful and uh, appreciated by the student audience. Thirdly, student database needs to be subdivided to make it easier for students to navigate between the objects. And of course, the question rises here, did the history of childhood in Latvia ended uh, in the 1990s? Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, your uh, attention and we are ready for uh, your questions uh, or comments. Uh, we have one question in uh, Padlet, so I can uh, write it down. Uh, you mentioned that, that the prototype of the database is available for students. Could you say how many objects are there in each of these groups? Uh, and uh, I can answer for this question, <laughs> if I may. Uh, and uh, currently for students are available uh, 95 objects in database, approximately 20 in each group. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of uh, RAV metadata which need to be analyzed and supplemented with information and then it will be available for students. Maybe colleagues, uh, you can... <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, Ines, uh, uh, for, uh, for this comment. Indeed, uh, when we went to museums, we asked them uh, uh, to offer us five uh, to ten objects. Actually, I think uh, we all came back from museums uh, with uh, even hundred of mapped uh, objects because uh, it was difficult for, for us to choose which one would be the best one. And also uh, museums were very well uh, prepared and they offered uh, their funds and uh, it was really nice experience uh, of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, so yeah, uh, any other question or comment? There were uh, already uh, uh, raised hands from Angelo and Michael Gates, so Michael Gates. So I think they can ask their question. Yeah, I I don't. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't see raise uh, raise hands. Uh, who was first? Uh, uh, Our, sorry, yeah. I was actually yeah, applauding. Angelo. 
Arnus, I was actually applauding oh, and, me, me too. <laughs> Mikael as well, yes, I saw it. Uh, so I, there's I, this I option, hope... don't. <laughs> um, okay. So, but anyway, may, 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 I, I could take this opportunity to ask something because you, Iveta, you, you, you said um, um, about selecting the best object, but when you already start to think like that, you're already filtering and in a way starting from your own ideas, etc. So I, I'm not so sure whether that's the best thing to do or what, what is behind this little word, the best object. See what uh, I mean? Thank you, uh, Angelo. Yes, uh, of course, we are thinking uh, about uh, uh, this, but uh, the key uh, uh, idea is these uh, five groups created from students' mm. uh, uh, master thesis. Mm. Because uh, our challenge, the, uh, the most challenge, is to put this uh, current educational problems uh, in historical mm. perspective. And, there, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, this database uh, is actually... Uh, uh, something new because usually all databases are uh, created from museums' perspective, from mm. uh, historians' uh, perspective. They always group objects uh, by periods, by uh, by by uh, materials, yeah, uh, uh, as historians do usually. But we are trying uh, to fit uh, with this database for current students' interest. And on the, uh, this, uh, this approach uh, to teach them how to do uh, historical research. Yeah, uh, it is, of course, it is very challenging and uh, I am uh, absolutely not, uh, <laughs> not sure that uh, our, we just started, yes, uh, that our approach is the uh, best uh, uh, one. But, uh, but the good uh, news is that students like uh, like to, uh, to 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 work with uh, with it because it is something new, something personalized, uh, and they offer already objects for our database for their uh, own collections. So thank you for the uh, question. Uh, yeah. Uh, any other comments, or we are going uh, uh, further. To next presentation, and the next uh, uh, presentation will be de uh, uh, delivered by Professor Mark de Pape, uh, who is uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Leuven, uh, who is a honorary doctor of University of Latvia, and also a leading researcher uh, at the Institute of Pedagogical uh, Sciences at the University uh, of uh, uh, Latvia. Please, uh, uh, Mark, floor is yours, and I will share and manage your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Iveta. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable to give this lecture from my uh, home, and uh, uh, therefore I have sent to you uh, beforehand the PowerPoint as well as the uh, full text of, because you can read it um, when you have time and you can ha have a look at the uh, PowerPoint, which is not uh, exactly the same as the text. I will try to present, to do two things together, uh, not to read the text, but probably here and there some uh, sentence. And uh, I want to just to talk about my ideas because it's just ideas. And the title of my lecture is The Fragile Boundary Between Education and Educationalization. Indeed, these personal reflections are at uh, a certain level uh, a warning not to use too much history and the historical institutions like uh, courses, like research, like 
uh, museums uh, for educational uh, purposes or even for educationalized purposes, which is uh, uh, probably even uh, worse. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's good to start. Next slide. Yeah, it's good to start a little bit uh, to get to get the idea of what I'm thinking and what I want to say by starting uh, starting by by the abstract. When you look at museums, always to prove their social relevance, and I start in 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 the text with. Uh, school museums because I'm much familiar with that, more familiar with, with them. And then I go to the other museums that try to represent childhood and so on. Well, when you look at these museums, often you see that the social relevance of these museums is done in a statement that uh, refers to the educational value of the museum, to the educational task, and even to the educational message of the museum. And it is a bit against this uh, tide of trend that I want to pay action here, attention here, excuse me, to the often exaggerated educational aspirations, which are, I think, more rhetoric than reality. And to my mind, the boundary between education and even educationalization, and I mean that in the word uh, of patronizing and so on, is a fragile one and can be easily exceeded if one uh, is ignoring too much the cultural historical context of the materials of the museum, uh, materials of the museum items and uh, so on. What is the educational value of museums? I think if we want to change behavior, to change attitudes, this is so complex that it relates to personal formation, what the Germans called Bildung, and this is not uh, even predictable. What we can do is offer, uh, giving an offer of some uh, images of some material that could be a confrontation, that could uh, open a dialogue, that could open a new perspective the person did not know beforehand, and so probably change something in his or her mind. But planning that too much is, I think, in vain. Uh, so my plea is... Um, as I have done before for the history of education research itself, is try to be as close as possible to your cultural historical research, to your data, to your interpretation of data, and not uh, looking behind for some ideological or educational purpose or uh, whatever. Does that mean that we can do nothing? No, of course. Uh, does that mean that we are against museums? Of course not. And I think uh, support also from uh, government and so on will be necessary to continue that. But the uh, paradox, of course, the more governments and policy is giving money to museums, the more they want to foster that educational task of the museums and educational task is then instrumentalized for their own uh, policy more than once. That is the main idea of my talk and I have to look at the watch and now I would like to have the other slides and we can go a little bit faster, I think. In the first paragraph, I try to uh, say how it comes that I uh, have to reflect on uh, these uh, ideas. Well, it has, of course, to do with the projects we, we heard about. Uh, uh, Iveta explained that I am still affiliated to the Riga, uh, uni to the Latvian University and I want to uh, do my job. So uh, 
uh, what can I do for this project? I am not, uh, I do not have museological knowledge or experience, except that I have been come uh, advisor for uh, the uh, National uh, Museum in, you know, of Education in Ypres, which was a municipal uh, museum, not it intended to reflect on the history of education in Belgium, but it was not sponsored by the federal government or uh, whatever. Also in international context, I have done a little bit of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, guiding uh, some museum like in Portugal and so on, but uh, I am only a modest historian of education. And I think school museums has to do something with history of education. And I published a lot about theory, methodology, and historiography of education, and even of uh, history of childhood, which is, of course, related to the history of education. And if we look at these uh, publications, and over the years, and to the history of the history of education, you can see that is uh, that there has been a constant tension between educational and historical. Uh, of course, this is not a story of white and black. There is a lot of gray uh, in between, but it is also a paradoxical relationship because most historians of education, although as historians are affiliated in educational context and educational institutions, and the more they stress the historical and the cultural historical dimension of their research, the less relevant they become, at first glance at least, for their educational institutions. And this had lead, has led with other factors, of course, to uh, diminishing the role of history of education, which was historically at the core of the curriculum in, for instance, teacher training. And it's going to disappear in a lot of institutions, unfortunately. But do we have then to uh, stress again this educational and often educationalized value? I don't think so. Can I have the next slide, which I, I for every, uh, my, my uh, talk is four paragraphs, as you can see, and I try to find some illustrations to make it attractive, as the educators would say. And here you say that the Latvian uh, connection uh, is behind uh, my speech and that I want to foster this uh, connection in future times as well. Thank you very much. The next one, please. Um, so the, the, the first paragraph, which is, of course, the second, because the first is the introduction, um, deals with the uh, school museums, education museums, mostly school museums. Uh, what can we see about it? Well, about the origins of the museums, we have to say, first of all, that these uh, museums were uh, or, or originated in relation to for instance, world exhibitions. And that in fact, the term museum was a little bit misleading. And this is already a historical fact. It gives us uh, what, what history is. Uh, terms are coined in different times and have different semantic uh, and conceptual uh, meanings. Museum in the middle of the 19th century was uh, kind of an educational exhibition, an exhibition like the world and the world fairs, the world exhibitions. They wanted to show how good and how well developed uh, didactic materials were at that time. And so it had uh, the, the role of uh, a fair of uh, 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 a big uh, exhibition in which you can go to, to look for the modern, the actual modern trends and education. It's only from the 1970s onward when uh, little schools and schools at the countryside 
uh, risk to disappear due to, for instance, uh, merging uh, with uh, greater institutions and so on, and modernization of education and modernization of didactic materials and so on, that, uh, for instance, in Germany, a lot of uh, new museums arose all over uh, the world. Most of them were, of course, uh, related to education because it were uh, all teachers mostly and people who were, we call them, Frank Simon and I, school foxes, people that lived through schools and had a school history and of course were very nostalgic about uh, the, the past and their career and they were happy with that and they wanted to show how good it was and how well uh, schools and what a good function schools did to elevate people to uh, contribute to the progress it's the neoliberal idea of modernization of progress and progress came it's the rosy glow over uh, educational history uh, uh, the schools were the uh, most important factor in the world to uh, for, for progress of uh, society and um, uh, in, in a lot of cases they attract people uh, they attract uh, school children and they want to share that message with school children, but also with elderly people, uh, uh, people that retired and that come with buses. And they have a very attractive play because in these schools, mostly you can play histo what they call in, in Germany, historical instruction. Uh, and they play the teaching in an old fashioned school and there is the, the schoolmaster, but there is also the audience and they have to listen to the our schoolmaster that is teaching us and disciplining us and so on and so on and so on. Next slide, please. In uh, 2016, there was an international conference on school museums organized by the French speaking international community and around the museum in Rouen, uh, which exists also since the 19, uh, beginning of the 1980s. Um, the first conference we had, or the second conference in Sèvres, in uh, Ishe conference, we went to that museum because it was related to the idea of national education and, and so on. One, uh, the introduction is written by uh, Jean-Francois Condet, uh, who is professor at the University of Lille. And uh, he is, I think, one of the most uh, leading uh, persons in the text. I am uh, quoting as much, but you see also this double aspect, a little bit ambiguous. On, on, on the one hand, and I, I, I agree with that, he thanks these uh, nostalgic schoolmasters because they protect the, uh, the material and they have saved the material uh, uh, for, for the memory and so on. Uh, but um, on, on the one hand, uh, he wants to introduce school museums in, in the curriculum. They are important for future teachers, but on the other hand, they are even more important for research. And that is, I think, my point of view uh, as well. Um, uh, old uh, uh, museums must not become, this is the, the final uh, quotation, uh, a kind of graveyards for all things. Uh, they are at least something like history uh, in the sense that they have the, the same task of historical research. And I think this is contextualization, nuancing, uh, also uh, uh, everyday thinking uh, or today thinking or present thinking about uh, what is going in, in uh, actual debates and education and trying to find arguments and history to underpin your statement. I think this is not uh, a good 
uh, idea. So this could be, uh, or this can lead to presentism also in looking at uh, the history. Uh, next slide, please. So my idea is that in uh, school museums, you have to be very careful about using also uh, present day concepts. You can use them, but uh, you have to avoid that uh, museums are also kind of a tribunal in which you want to judge uh, moral judgment of uh, actual education policy, even about uh, what uh, things went wrong in history and so on and so on. I think you have, and I discussed that in the text, I cannot go due to the time into detail, but um, you can make an offer by selecting uh, well-chosen uh, material for your museum that there is a kind of dialogue with the past and that can uh, result in, for instance, an aha erlebnis, uh, aha mo moment for uh, that facilitated, uh, facilitates uh, liberating, engaging, and sometimes also healing dialogue with the past. One of the examples that is treated in uh, the text is the so-called peace education, which gives you, of course, peace education uh, and a lot of, how, how do you present peace in a museum? How do you represent peace? There is nothing to represent unless war. And this is a little bit the, the very ambiguous uh, thing, also the paradoxical thing. You want to teach something, uh, but does that has effect? If you look at uh, what's going on in society, you dare to doubt about uh, the effects and the success of this educational uh, message, I think. So these are the things that are discussed in the text. I think learning from the past, also that hank hankering, hankering for, for uh, lessons from the past, what we can learn from the past is probably wisdom, but uh, nothing much, uh, not, nothing more than, than that. Anyway, um, this is a slide for uh, childhood museums. You see the stereotypes, the social contracts do uh, uh, live also in that environment. And this is here a, uh, a poster from uh, a conference in Czechoslovakia and in, in Czechia and in, in Prague. And you see the new school is related to the new society, to the new Europe even. Uh, and is this the same of uh, childhood museum? That's the question. Can we uh, uh, see analogies between school museums and museums of a childhood and children and childhood. That was the question. Next uh, slide, uh, please. Also there, I try to, uh, in, in the second paragraph of uh, my text, to draw a little bit the history of childhood museums, like it was expressed in the uh, paper of Iveta and her uh, colleagues. Um, childhood museums also come from the middle of the 19th century, but they have a little bit uh, different origins. And probably this is related to the, the paradox I already have said between historians and educators. You can uh, expect that uh, childhood museums and childhood history is much more written by historians. Nevertheless, uh, they also have been, these museums, part of popular uh, education. Museums had to educate, to educate and museums about childhood and children had to educate children. That was the idea from the Enlightenment. And moreover, they had also a very one dimensional line of past, pre uh, present and future thinking. They also uh, used analogies from the present to underpin the past 
for instance, even in antiquity, uh, a history of, of antiquity uh, was related uh, at the end of the 20th century with the upheavals of the 1960s, with the difficult uh, youth, and there was also difficult youth in, in um, ancient uh, Greece and Rome and so on and so on. So presentism is certainly not only an education, uh, an educational history or history of education present, it is also in cultural history uh, somewhere. You can find it and also in uh, cultural museums of uh, childhood and so on. The same applies for the use of contemporary conceptual tools in writing history, in describing history, in describing uh, uh, materials. I think this is an inescapable paradox of the historiographical operation, as uh, Michel de Certeau has called it. Uh, but I want to be very careful in that. As I said, I think we are not, uh, it's not our duty, it's not our message to make uh, comparisons with the past and to say it's better now, it's worse now, and so on. This is highly difficult and certainly uh, you should try to uh, avoid using a historical argumentation, I think, in uh, political debate about uh, pedagogy and so on. Also, I think there is an idolatry about interactive pedagogy and the use of ICT, just like it is in education at the moment. All museums and their statements are uh, using that. Of course, you can uh, use, uh, like we do today, uh, some computer material uh, in, in, in a rather efficient way to communicate with each other, but thinking that everything uh, what is ICT is gold also for museums is, I think, uh, a little bit nonsense or a little bit exaggerated. All these things uh, that tend to go to in the direction of uh, educationalization, patronization, um, deliberately want to give a message to the people, wanting to educate people in the direction we have the idea and they have to follow our ideas, is, uh, I think, a result of uh, the neoliberal discourse of the enlightenment of the modernization and of the idea of utility, of relevance, even everything should be relevant and everything should be managed. And you can find that, of course, in the mission statements of all museums, which are filled with educational uh, targets. And if you analyze, for instance, those of peace education, I've done that for uh, Ypres, Wipers, of course, uh, where we have seen uh, a kind of use and misuse of museums and uh, also in the political, but also in the economic scenes uh, in, in the centenary, uh, according to the centenary of the First World War, uh, Ypres was, of course, the center for remembering the uh, First World War. And here, there is, of course, a huge difference. I want to uh, speak about that also in, in my text between uh, historical research and memory. But uh, I have to go uh, further because time is already up. Uh, the next slide, please. So you see, uh, you have in cultural underpinned uh, museums of childhood, the same, these pictures are from a museum in Cologne, in Germany, analogous educational myths and idols, uh, idols uh, stereotypes, you may say, uh, social contract, constructs of youth and uh, of adult, uh, adolescence and so on, that, and adulthood that continued in, in, in history. Next slide, please. 
what can we do? I think if we look at real education, I said this is related in my mind to building, is just an offer when we can expect that it has effect, but uh, we cannot plan it too much and we uh, must not guide too much, I think, uh, take the people by the hand and lead them, not through the streets of London, but through the museum, I think. Um, an individual, it's an individual encounter. My telephone is ringing, but I will not uh, take it. Individual encounter with well-chosen remnants of the past can give some uh, dialogue, empathy, but also irony. And it gives you consciousness of former pedagogical mentalities. I think time is up, it's 10 o'clock, but uh, you can read what I want to say more deeply in the text and that it was therefore that I have sent it beforehand. I thank you very much for your uh, patience, for your attention and I would like have to be with you and in the next uh, uh, slide please, the next slide you will see which is an image I know uh, yeah, that is uh, going back because I think even uh, uh, smart people like La Fontaine knew uh, unconsciously what I wanted to say. Uh, pedagogization, educationalization is always moralization. And if you talk with schoolmasters, they preach, they preach, they preach, they preach. I think we have to avoid that. And next slide, and then I will stop. The next one is thanks. And if you don't like my message, please don't shoot to the messenger as it was posted the 25th of October, but there is no year in the museum of uh, uh, Rouen. Uh, plus fait douceur que violence, gentleness is better, I think, than violence for uh, a speaker. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, thank you very much, and uh, please do you have any uh, questions or uh, any comments uh, to this very rich presentation, I can say. I don't have a question, but I have a comment or, or, or an observation. I think uh, if we think about uh, the topic children in museum, uh, I think we should separate at least two things. The representation of the children in museum exhibitions and, um, and uh, the exhibition that is attractively adapted for the children. Um, all I just wanted to say that uh, very often um, school and educational contexts are not the only one that reveal the history of children and childhood. So, uh, in my opinion, we should pay uh, more uh, attention to the child experience uh, in different social contexts. For example, child and family, child and child and work, and work, or or or, or whatever. Um, that's my observation. Uh, if I think about those museums, what I have seen and where I have seen or where I have uh, discovered discovered childhood history or, or, or uh, children uh, in a historical perspective. That's my small comment. Yeah. Uh, am I supposed to say something about that? I think this is right. You have, <laughs> no, to, yeah. you, you, you have to differentiate between the representation on the one hand and on, on, on the other hand, also the uh, education context they want to use this representation but there could be from time to time I think there is a link between the two because one select probably the items for the museum and thus also the way in which uh, these children are represented in museum can be useful or they wanted to make it useful for their educational purpose they have with the museum <clears throat> uh, 
e even in the selection process, this can play a role, I think, no? Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for, for this comment. I also, uh, uh, actually, uh, your presentation raises this question, how to present or how to uh, get from museums uh, uh, these uh, these concepts, which are not tangible, yeah, as you said about peace, about uh, uh, I, I also can use this example for uh, from my students about talented children, about uh, uh, and uh, it is uh, actually I uh, I think uh, very important in our research how to a. Uh, uh, Use it or uh, or for uh, for example prestige of uh, teacher yeah how to represent it in museums or how to see it uh, in uh, in museums uh, I think it is uh, yeah at least at our project it is very topical actually okay. So, uh, any other comment or question? So, uh, if no, then, uh, then we have uh, our uh, coffee break and we will meet uh, again at uh, 11 uh, Riga. Uh, 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 11.30, uh, half past uh, uh, 11, uh, uh, Riga time, or uh, in other countries, I suppose it is much uh, earlier. So, see you uh, in, in 30 minutes. Thank you. Iveta, Iveta. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Is, yeah. Nice to see, see you. <laughs> I, I I put my video. Yeah. No, I, I just want to tell you what I do with the PowerPoint. I can I can present the PowerPoint from my house or I need to send it to you. No, you have uh, you can present it uh, from your house. Ah. You uh, you see the screen button uh, on on the desktop, yeah. Mm -hmm. Share screen, but we can yeah. uh, we can try it. Uh, just try it now because your uh, presentation is the first uh, first one, and we will see how uh, how does it work. Good morning, Iveta. I'm Oliver. I would morning, also ask uh, the same uh, question. Professor Pleso, uh, you are the person which I uh, meet first time uh, here. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, there, uh, therefore, uh, I'm addressing you more uh, formally because other uh, people I know by uh, person. Pe uh, perfectly, uh, Maria, you just, uh, you can, uh, and... Uh, the next presenter uh, I am giving floor to uh, is Maria del Mar del Pozo Andreas, uh, full professor in history and theory of education uh, at the University del Alcala, Spain. Please, <coughs> Maria, floor is yours, and I am very happy that Professor Braster is also uh, here. Uh, uh, so, uh, Maria, could you share your screen, please? Yes, hello. Let's see if we can, we are trying to, to show the PowerPoint. Okay, you can see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, 
thank you, Iveta, for this uh, um, invitation to, to um, speak about uh, the topic of uh, the pedagogical museums. Thank you for all your efforts for trying to get us in, in Riga. It was a real pity that uh, we are not there, but uh, we are still having the memories. The memories of the H.E. conference, one of the most beautiful ones I have attended. And it's good to remember because, um, well, uh, the, the session of today is very much about memories, everything we are going to, to do. So uh, when, when I was writing my presentation, I had in mind the, the visit to the Ethnographical Museum of Riga and with the dinner, the dancing, etc. Well, that one day I hope that it comes back. And the second thing I wanted to say is uh, if um, Mark uh, thinks that they are going to shoot at him, he should be calm because I think that really you are going to shoot at me. <laughs> I will be the one uh, that uh, will be, uh, well, it, it will be a bit strange because uh, you are speaking with, uh, uh, I'm going to speak about pedagogical museums, but uh, I was not believing in them so much when, a few years ago, and now that I'm uh, uh, connected with one of them, I, I'm full of doubts, and I'm going to share with you basically all my doubts. Um, anyway, when when I was connecting uh, today with the with the meeting, uh, six or seven minutes later, the the the, the first uh, word I was listening was the word musealization, and I think that. Uh, this is exactly the, the key word. If, if uh, we like to speak about the, the museums of uh, education or of pedagogical museums in the, at this moment in the world, basically it goes inside a, a, a kind of framework that is the idea of the musealization of everyday life. Sharon McDonald in, in her book of memory lands, uh, she's speaking about all the obsession that there are now for collecting and displaying objects that were considered in the past uh, like uh, normal and that now they have become completely special as this part of the memory phenomenon that uh, had grown increasingly in the 70s. That it has gone also in Spain. And in Spain, we don't have as you have in Latvia so uh, such a clear uh, um, index and, and uh, catalog of all the museums they are, but we have um, a kind of typology that it was published in Pedagogic Historica in 2017 by my colleagues Pablo Álvarez and Pauli Dávila. And in relation with that, you can see that we had like three kinds of uh, museums in, in, in Spain. The ones that can be considered the museums of the folk life, the ones that uh, normally they are organized in village school buildings, and they are part of more big ethnographical museums that um, try to keep uh, alive the, the village life. Um, this Museums of education, they have a very, very strong symbolic meaning because in Spain, and now with the pandemic much more, with the, uh, there is the idea that many villages, they were lost and abandoned and, uh, and death in the moment that the school was closed. And the school was closed normally about 1970s, in the 70s, with a new law of education. And the children were going to the cities and to the big villages to be educated because they, they could have more opportunities and like this, they could go to secondary education. So it was good for the children, but they had never returned to the village. So these museums, the narrative of these ethnographical museums in the villages is always very, very clear. They pretend to show um, like the last image of the school. It's like if uh, um, they had, it was a snapshot of the uh, school the day that it was closed for the last time and the school teacher was disappearing. And of course, uh, it's not true because all the inhabitants of the village uh, had given their, uh, their books and their notebooks and school books. So 
is much more than that. And also the, the second objective of, the, of these museums is to awake the nostalgia. Uh, they, they are um, uh, impulsing very much what is called the heritage industry with the idea of, uh, well, that the, the, the middle age or the old people goes to, to visit these museums and, and uh, remember what is about the school and or what it was there at school. And what I must say is that really I, I have visited many of these museums, but I never get this nostalgic idea. And it's also said, for example, Yuri Meda has said it also about Italy. And the, the people that visit the museum, normally they, they don't identify with, with this school or in general, or with this particular type of school that uh, does not awake our memories. But okay, this is a matter of discussion. We have the second kind of museums that are the rich ones, really, the regional education museums that uh, have been uh, uh, granted and uh, have been uh, created by the communities, by the um, different communities that they are in Spain. They are given uh, they had a lot of money because basically with these uh, museums, what the communities want is to develop a kind of national or regional identity. This is why normally in these museums there is a lot of flags or a lot of maps of the community and also a lot of material from the historical schools of this particular geographical area because the idea is to preserve the identity of this area. These museums, they organize a lot of activities, especially with children. Um, they have also classrooms, <laughs> because this is vital, but the classrooms are different classrooms from different periods, and then normally from the middle of the 19th century till the typical classroom, like you see in the Pedagogical Museum of Galicia, the typical classroom of, uh, 19, of 1970. And then we have what I want to speak, the pedagogical museums of the faculties of education. There is the list of the pedagogical museums we have now. The last one is the one coming in my own university in Alcalá. It will be open in one month. And basically what it shows is that the, the pedag to have a pedagogical museum in the faculty of education in Spain, from the moment that the first one was created in the 90s, it has become a must. You must have a pedagogical museum and it has become trendy. Whatever happens, um, your faculty of education looks better if you have this museum. In many cases, how these pedagogical museums have been created, well, many of them from the scientific courses that they were in the former teachers training colleges, because many of the faculties of education in Spain, the origin was a teacher's training college. Some of them with the heritage of uh, primary schools of the city of the region that were given it. Some of them with the archives of university professors, but the professional archives, um, the books and the words of the students that they were keeping. And some of them, and this is my case, is from the private collection built by a professor from the faculty. Some of them they have become from collections of archives and life stories of retired or dead primary school teachers. And at least in one case, in the case of the one of Salamanca, it was starting with the gathering and the donation of objects by students. And others, they had come from research projects that had allowed them to digitalize. And many, they had got money and they had gone to the antiquities. This is some examples of the first pedagogical museums. As you may see, they still have in the classroom. The ones, for example, the one of the Basque Country, they have made the classroom, is constructed. Probably they have the, the first bunch, and from there they have built the complete classroom. There we go to the pedagogical museum of Antonio Molero, that is the guy that you see in the, in the up left. Uh, he was the first professor of history of education in Alcalá. He was my, my colleague. And this is why I was involving myself in this project, because he knew how much he was liking his museum. 
and the other photographs at the day that uh, in February of 2021, the donation by the widow was going to the university with the rector of our university. And this is what we have found because when for arriving to, to the photograph that you see before, first you have to work very much. We have been working, some colleagues and me, during three years because what we were finding was um, three rooms downstairs of the house of uh, my, my professor, three full rooms, completely full of all kind of material that, that you can imagine, everything. You don't know where the offsets are coming from, from Antiquas, from United States, from France. There is very few descriptions of them. When, uh, when Antonio Molero, when the, the professor was uh, um, uh, giving some of these objects to exhibitions, and I had the, the, the tag where he was describing the offset, you also see that he does not know so much about these objects, perhaps some of these objects, they are not related with the, with, with the schools. And we had to organize a kind of catalog. And when you start with this catalog, you really realize how few you know about these objects. Even if you are a historian of education, you, they are completely discontextualized. Uh, for example, this was a moment when we were working, and this is an example of an offset that we have. Really, we don't know if it is from a school, we don't know if it is from a church, we don't know if it is old, we don't know if it is new. We like it, but we don't know so much about it. Uh, in the last years, uh, and probably because my my influence, I was always uh, telling Molero to 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 buy. Uh, instructional material, material that could be uh, for, for, for teaching, but also in a, in a kind of a progressive idea, because I, I knew that uh, the, the other museums, they had less. And yes, we had many of this school material, but we don't know very much how, how it was used. Well, when we were at the same time that we were doing the catalog, the faculty of education of uh, my faculty of education had found a place for the museum. We had the Aula Magna is in the 16th century school, in the 16th century church. And well, the museum will be there in, in a small part that is the sacristy where the, 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 the priest in the past, uh, he was dressing himself. It's a very, very small place. But uh, this is what we have uh, for the moment. We don't have anything more. And there you see the last part when the offsets that uh, were in the museum of, uh, uh, in, in the house of, uh, downstairs in the house of Molero were coming to the, to the sacristy and they are, they are disorganized and we must find out uh, what, what we do with that. And at this moment, the problems go on. Because, uh, yes, first you must decide. Well, first you have very few room. Uh, second, we, we must decide exactly which offices you are going to select. This is one of the main problems. Which offices you are going to select, what you do with them? Because, yes, there you see some of the ones we have. And uh, we don't want, probably because uh, I have... I have seen many, many um, pedagogical museums and I always get this kind of storehouse effect that everybody wants to show what we have and to display many things. And then the designers of the exhibition that are uh, the designers of the, of the university and me, we agree in the idea that there must be very few offsets. We can, uh, we, we must, we should select very few. We, but. Also, the, and, and this is even a bigger problem, you don't know which narration, which story you can tell with these objects. Because these objects, uh, maybe they have a life of their own, but uh, they, uh, you don't know the story of them. There are objects that have no author, you don't know where they are coming from, and the owner was lost. The owner, if it was a child, with the books or the, or it's lost. We don't know anything about them. So, and also what is lost is the time space line because many of these bunches and many of these sources, you, even if you can find out when it was produced, 
you don't know during how many years it was used. Perhaps 20, 30 or 40 years more. So these are a kind of things that you don't know. And then, of course, it looks like if all the uh, pedagogical museums, you must um, awake in the, in the viewers, in, in the visitors, the emotions and the nostalgia. And I ask, me, I ask myself, but why? We must awake this. And by the way, what is going to be the audience of this museum? The, the eldest people, the youngest people, the colleagues, the, the, the teachers, the students. Uh, well, we don't know. So, uh, and, and of course, it was a certain moment. Uh, I, I must say that that was interesting because we are always saying that the, the history of education is not important in our faculties of education. But when the have arrived to organize the museum, absolutely everybody was giving all the collection and everything to me. And I don't, I, I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want to commit the mistake of thinking that it is because I'm important. It is because they don't know what to do with it. And then they have given it to me and then they say, well, you can write the story, you can do whatever you like. And then you come with the idea that, yes, if you tell a, a typical history of education, a history of education based in the or in educational politics or based in the curriculum, eh, 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 organize several corners where there are the different subjects, but it does not go with the objects, absolutely at all. So at the end, what I have done, and I'm not satisfied anything at all, but I cannot do anything at all, eh, what I have done is to look at eh, um, in, in the literature, in the memories, in the diaries, I have collected a lot of uh, personal texts of teachers and students, uh, diaries, trying to uh, uh, find a kind of connection between the outsets and the wars in such a way that I could make um, a speak a possible um, owner, not, not the owner, but a possible owner or a person or, of a possible user of the objects. For example, this there you see one of the cases in which uh, we had many, many medals and a famous actor in a book, he speaks about how they were giving these medals in the classes as a sign of honor and as a basis of the military organization. Uh, because the school was a military organization. What I had found by, by looking at that, I had found that many, many of the offsets that we consider them the typical educational offsets, for example, and, and that we had many in the, in the museum, for example, the, the, the volumes, the offsets that represent uh, volumes and capacities and, uh, and the meters, the, 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 the meters in the, in the geometry classroom. I did not find absolutely any description of a child speaking about these objects. And even I had found, I did not find descriptions of the teachers saying how they were using these objects. So I'm asking myself now, there is really a, a dialogue or a connection between the objects the, and, and what the, the teachers were really doing in the school and the children were learning in the school, I don't know. And then uh, my last thoughts is about the teaching possibilities offered by the pedagogical museums or the faculties of education. I also believe that they had much more research possibilities than teaching possibilities. So at this moment, my only idea is, well, as I, I had listened in the, in the project of Latvia, to try to impulse between the students a master thesis and bachelor thesis where they do that they are um, circumscribed, that they are centered in the biography or genealogy of educational losses to try to see if, uh, and, and I don't know if that will be possible and if the faculty will allow it because it's very much focused in the practice of now. Um, I see the possibility, because that has been done in other pedagogical museums, to involve the students in the recuperation of the educational heritage of their city. Normally, when the museum comes, probably we will get a lot of uh, offsets, and with that, the students, perhaps they involve, and by involving, they will learn uh, heritage education, and they will apply it in their schools. It, it goes, uh, perhaps we can connect it with uh, the with, uh, 
um, a, pol a, a political trend that there is now in Spain, that is the law, the future law of democratic memory, that will be even applied in the university because the, the, the government wants that even in the university we teach the students um, democratic memory, which is uh, to, to teach them how uh, the past uh, of the war and the Franco period, how it was happening. And with that, the, the, the museum and to speak about education of this period will be really very important. And what they are doing in many other uh, pedagogical museums in, in Spain is to recuperate the, the, the school and the teachers' memories, for example, by, by doing a lot of interviews with teachers and with former students. Well, that I was doing it from the 90s. I, I, I'm not so secure that you need the museum for, for recuperating that, but perhaps the, 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 to have the, the atmosphere of the museum perhaps awakes more memories or perhaps... Um, disturbs and, and pervert the memories of the of the people that we do the interview. Anyway, what I think is that at least it will make think our students that will be future teachers, because if they see that it's so important to um, recuperate the memory of the past, but also if they see that the memory always comes, always comes and is present, they will be much more aware of how they must teach themselves because they are teaching practice, they are relation with the students, they are they, they, what, what they do with the students, it will stay in the memory of the students and it will come back. And that will, I'm completely secure that that will make them be better teachers. The memory will make them better teachers. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Maria, for this very interesting uh, case of uh, Spain about a uh, new uh, museum. Uh, so, uh, so, any questions and comments, Maria, you can stop now to share the uh, screen. Yes, <clears throat> we have a question in Andrew. So, Maria. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you made a catalog. If uh, this catalog is available in internet environment? Uh, no, for the moment not, uh, because first is very amateur catalog. For example, we have a lot of maps, many, many maps, and really, uh, and, and this is something I wanted to say. We should not commit the mistake of thinking that because we are historians of education, we know about everything. I have said many, many times that the maps are for the geographers and the scientific instruments are for the scientists and that the... Uh, I don't know nothing. So with the maps, we were uh, calculating, uh, for, for dating them, we were having a bit of historical framework, the First World War, the Second World War, uh, Morocco, because Morocco, it was uh, uh, sometimes a part, of, a part of Spain and sometimes not, the, the colonies, the, the, the former Spanish Empire. And with that, we have a bit of date, but uh, the catalog was done basically for um, the university has appointed the person that was uh, evaluating how much it was costing the, the collection and, and they needed to have that. So it's very amateur. But uh, at this moment, um, we are trying to get the um, laboratory technician and, and this person should do a real uh, serious catalog with the help of, of experts. This is uh, because, uh, in fact, uh, I always say that the museum... And, is under construction. It's, it's the beginning. It's, uh, it's, it's very few. It's, uh, <laughs> I had the, the completely different narrative than all my colleagues in Spain, that they always come with, the muse with their museums and look how wonderful it is. Well, I'm the opposite. I only see, I only see problems and I only see uh, issues that must be resolved <laughs> and nothing more. Yesterday when I was preparing the lecture and I was looking for the photographs, I was thinking, well, we had worked very much during these three years, but I see more how much more things they must come and they must be done. Uh, 
thank you, Maria. And uh, Joanna uh, has a question. Please, Joanna. Thank you. It's both a question and a comment. I'm absolutely fascinated with your presentation and uh, with the museum and with the story, how you were telling how you are creating um, the museum. And have you considered putting what, that, what you are doing uh, into the framework of public history? So um, history um, understood as um, telling about the past for the public, but also by the public, with the public and about the public. And I think that's what you are doing fits here very well. And uh, the story is, well, it deserves um, attention, publication, I don't know, sharing uh, to show, I, I suppose that the others also not only have the collections, but also uh, have their problems, which probably they are not so, uh, you know, open about, and that's, uh, that's the difference. Um, and I also uh, wanted with this public history concept uh, uh, to invite you or to propose you to consider par participation in the public history summer school that uh, we are organizing in Wrocław and it's addressed also for the students. So if you are invited, if you proposing um, such uh, master thesis for, for them, it would fit really uh, well here. I would love to listen how they work on such uh, thesis because we have the public history program here and uh, um, we are struggling with the form of the thesis and of the proportion between practical activities and theoretical concepts. So uh, I would love to listen how you are solving um, this issue. Uh, to what extent it's their practical activities and to what extent it's their theoretical re reflections. And uh, last but not least, uh, I'm thinking uh, about a book uh, following the next public history summer school, um, tentatively entitled Public History of Things. So those things can be the objects that you are also mentioning and object biographies and how, what kind of work uh, it involves to create such a biography. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Joanna, because yes, I'm very much involved in public history, but not exactly with this project. This, this project for the moment, I see it more as um, uh, something for the faculty and, and why I, for, for our faculty, more, more is more, uh, because I, I, I don't want to be too ambitious. And why is that? Because two years ago, in 2019, I have uh, been the curator of a real big exhibition in history of education in the, in the Museum of the City of Madrid. And that was a totally different experience because at this moment I have a very clear narrative. I could put my research into divulgation and I could select the objects. I knew where they were in the archive, in the library, in the museums. I had looked in many museums uh, because I knew that they were there. And the experience is totally different because now you cannot have a narrative. The, the authors, you must try that the authors speak by you, are, but every story is different. You, or for the moment, I did not see the connection yet. So because the, the experience is so different, uh, for the moment, I... I I believe that it's better that the students involve and, and, and adopt in a way some of these objects and, and, and try to, to find the, the story. And, and of course, I think that because the, 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 the Faculty of Education is in a, in a small city, not, not a big city, and I believe that the, the school teachers and uh, they will be very interested very quickly. But... Uh, that uh, will be too much for the possibilities we have. <laughs> and I have seen some of my colleagues that they are maybe more enthusiastic than I am, that at the end they, they have shown us videos uh, with the old people so, uh, teaching history of education with the old school teachers, or with uh, there are also projects for, for people that is uh, starting with demands or Alzheimer's to, to try to, to uh, that they recuperate memories with, the, with, with these school houses. If I'm honest, I don't think that they will recuperate the memory with these school houses because I, I, I'm not even so secure that they were used daily in the school, some of them, because I don't find 
references to them anywhere, to the majority, not, not to the textbooks. The textbooks, of course, they were very much used, but the offsets, I had my doubts, but I'm not secure. <clears throat> thank you, Maria. Angelo, please, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, Maria, first of all, this was really interesting because um, it stimulated to think about things I'm doing and also with Joanna's um, response. Um, okay, I heard your uh, uh, answer to, to, to Joanna's response and I know the ambition is not really there or there are doubts and there are problems, et cetera, et cetera. But um, at least I see opportunities to, 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 to work with such a collection and, and to, to integrate it also in, 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 in a university program. Um, um, and, and perhaps to, 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 to combine with, with uh, the, the usual objects of such a museum. Um, to combine it with with responses from the audience uh, when you when you when you refer to to uh, recuperating memories um, creating memories um, seeing connections um, of course we are not always able to see connections but when you have visitors um, all kinds of visitors all kinds of ages etc all kinds of backgrounds um, of course they all see different things into the objects and the the selection of objects and the way you bring them together and um, this already stimulates reflection um, memories etc and you might uh, think of course this might be time consuming Th uh, think of um, using the small space you have so how you do it that's that's another thing um, to show uh, let's call it creative responses by the audience by students perhaps to particular objects or to the collection you show in this in the in this in this little room and to make it part an um, um, a dynamic part of, of, of the exhibition. This is something I, I'm, I've been doing with students, the creative responses. I've learned this from um, uh, Kathy Burke, uh, who, who used this uh, very often in, in, uh, in her teaching. And I'm also doing this in my uh, project seminars. I will very briefly refer to this in my own presentations, uh, presentation later on. Um, this perhaps rather comment than, than a question, Maria, um, but it's really a, a challenge uh, that that's for sure what you're doing there um, with all kinds of, of, of problems, but perhaps also uh, opportunities to, to do something with it and also to, to integrate it in, in um, well, teaching purposes as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Don't have to, you don't have to comment. Huh? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't want to. to I, I'm looking at the time and I don't want to take time of the mm. next uh, lecture. This is, I, I think that you and me, we can comment that. Uh, because, yes, it's, it's very interesting what you say, but if I start to speak, I will not stop. And <laughs> I think that we must move forward. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And uh, so we are going to the next uh, presentation. And so uh, I am welcoming uh, Professor uh, Dr. Oliver Plesso uh, from Institute of History at the University of Rostock. Uh, Professor Plesso, please, the uh, floor is uh, yours and you can share your presentation. Yes, thank you. Um... I cannot start my video, um, so you can't see me at this time, I think, because it says that you, the moderator, uh, doesn't allow me to share my video. That's different from before. Uh, so, uh, sorry, you can, uh, I think you can uh, push on uh, share screen. Could, uh, could you do this, please? I, I probably can do that. But um, I can't share my video for some reason. And we did it before because we just saw it. Because I, that's yeah. really surprising to me. Um, so you do see my presentation, I think. 
Yes, yes, we see yeah, your... Which is, of course, important, but I would, of course, very much like to be seen as well. I can't really understand... Yeah, I had to say, uh, may, if I may intervene, I had the same problem, but I logged again in, and then I could uh, set my video myself. Okay, so I may just go out and co come in again? Yeah, okay. if you take, take, then... Okay, so I hope I'm not gone for the fall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so let's uh, wait a bit uh, for uh, for this. Yes, it is uh, usual technical uh, problems, but we always have in in, in conferences uh, online. So, Professor uh, Pleso, we uh, we see you now, but we don't hear. Please uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't mute your uh, microphone. Please unmute, unmute. Yeah. Now yeah. you can hear me. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's, it would have been more important to have my voice than than my uh, than looking at me. But now I think we can do both, or or all three. And now I will share my screen. Uh, just a second. So you can see now see my screen, yes. and you can see me. Uh, so it's all yes. going to work. Best, all the best. Yeah, thank you as well for for inviting me and having me at your conference. And as everybody else, I'm really um, devastated that I cannot be in Riga at this time. And I'm wishing you all the best for your health situation. Uh, we are getting a worse health situation at this very time as well. So we all share the same fate. Um, my topic today: child soldiers, the end of World War II, and the pitfalls of recreating history between survivors, mass media, memory institutions, academia, and education. It's sort of a like Baroque title, a little long, but, but the presentation will be shorter than the uh, title maybe suggests. Um, as you have uh, just learned, I'm a historian and didactician. And uh, of course, I always know that didactician isn't even a proper word in English. And um, do you still, still see the presentation? You do, don't you? Yeah see and hear your presentation but unfortunately we don't uh, see you uh, but uh, but the presentation goes well because i see myself well whatever um so a didactician of course in the german speaking world and in some other languages uh is a person who is in between um the science and the pedagogy of a certain subject uh, as far as didacticians of history is, are concerned, as we may call us, um, we have for decades felt that historical consciousness is not only or not even predominantly formed in schools. And that's why we look at the totality of production of historical meaning on the individual as well as the societal level. Therefore, um, whenever you encounter a German language didactician of history, you always or most always encounter somebody who is not only um, into teacher edu history, teacher education, but also involved in memory studies and, as we heard before, public history. Um, you, you should see the Anne Frank page now, don't you? Yes, we see. Uh... Okay, so this works as before, so I won't ask again, but um, because I wasn't quite sure. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I've been specializing on the history on the historical representation of mass crimes, especially the show, but not only the Shoah. So I'm always looking at the media representation in films, books, pictures, music, school books, of course, school materials, educational materials, and the way um, these crimes and mass crimes are taught and, and atrocities are taught in formal and non-formal education. I'm always on high alert when I see the fate of children and adolescents at the center of educational materials that involve suffering, grief, and death. This alone, the question whether it is feasible or unfeasible, advisable or unadvisable, avoidable or unavoidable to learn about the suffering of the very young and the not so young could be and has been discussed at great length and could be at the center of my presentation, uh, but this will not be my focus today. Um, I just need this as a prerequisite for what I'm really going to have to say. Uh, I need a, an awareness on your side of the chances and challenges of using children's stories in such an educational context. Therefore, just a few points on the advantages and disadvantages of putting children and adolescents at the center of educational materials 
those are just two arbitrarily picked materials here, or activities involving mass atrocities like the Shoah. On the one hand, of course, there is the notion that it might be motivating, especially for young learners, to follow the fate of human beings their own age. There have been some studies that have suggested that it is not a given that children like to learn about other children's fates. There is, however, still a widespread feeling that it can be used as an incentive, especially if the educational material or educational activity is based upon individual stories. And we heard about personalization before using biographic, a biographical personal approach. Stories of children of the past can offer a path of identification, which in turn in turn can be understood as an inroads into historical learning. At the same time, of course, there are some risks involved in basing a pedagogy on stories of war atrocities in children. To name just two, first, one may ask at what particular age children are prepared to face stories that involve cruelty, suffering, death, and how these need to be presented to different age groups. There exists, there exists for example, a pedagogical discussion at what age children are ready to visit sites and museums of commemoration of Nazi atrocities and what to do with them once they are there and what not to do with them, what not to present to them when they are there. If the atrocities and cruelties are entirely left out at this site of commemoration, however, the narratives which are transported by the educational activities or materials may succumb to oversimplification or even naivete. Secondly, the issue of identification also poses a hazard to historical learning. <clears throat> if it is supposed to be rational, the learning is supposed to be rational and reflexive. An intense feeling of empathy, <coughs> sorry for that, I don't have water here, unfortunately. An intense feeling of empathy may lead to an over-identification that leaves no room for argumentation, gorging, reflexive distance, all of which we as educators, of course, encourage learners to adopt at the basic, as a basic attitude towards the world and learning. Therefore, educational materials and activities may be understood or can become overpowering. There is a broad consensus in the German-speaking world and elsewhere, of course, that this is to be avoided. In fact, ever since the 1970s, this has been included in an unofficial, one could call it a directive, followed by German educational institutions of all kinds, which is called the Beutelsbach Konsens, and I uh, don't know if you've heard about it, uh, which is not only taught in universities and colleges, but is followed in schools, teacher education facilities, museums, and sites of commemoration. Just if you haven't <coughs> yet come across it, it has got three pillars, namely the prohibition to overpower pupils or learners, <coughs> the requirement to present as controversial what is controversial in society, within the boundaries posed by human rights and tolerance, and finally the mandate to make as a reference point the interests perspectives, needs of learners, and that means to take seriously pupils and students <coughs> as partners in learning. <coughs> I'm very sorry, I don't have water yet, but it was really too bad to not think about that. <coughs> this may suffice for the moment. My main point, however, today is how important it is not to think of educational discussions and debates only as a free flow of <clears throat> competing or conjoining ideas, but to also take into consideration the individual and institutional agents or actors that are involved and their particular background, position, habitus, influence, or political role. That's not so difficult to do, but it's something we should think about. Especially if we look into sociology, we find ample methodologies, theoretical frameworks for an endeavor like that. If we just think of Pierre Bourdieu and, or, and the field theory or the actor network theory at this time, for example. Some years ago, I gave a presentation on sites of commemoration and tried to demonstrate that we shouldn't only look at the debates and the discussions and the positions that are exchanged, like, for example, where the children are dis uh, below a certain age should be invited <clears throat> should be invited to visit a site of commemoration but that we should also look at the vantage point that this is typical for the professions that are involved i did not stop there however 
but also argue that it is worth looking at the social embedding of each particular profession. It is, for example, important to note that high school teachers in German earn, as a rule, a, high, a far higher salary than educators in the memorial museums. They have, as a rule, more stable jobs and difficult biographical backgrounds. And this, of course, also interacts, uh, influences the way these two groups interact. It is, by the way, also <coughs> important to note that NGOs and the governmental agencies, which are we are used to seeing juxtaposed as civil society on the one side and state government on the other side, are much more intertwined in their collaboration with sites of museums or museums of commemoration than one might think at first glance. <clears throat> I want to apply a similar perspective to an educational material that I produced a while ago with a colleague of mine and that I considered suited to being discussed here at our conference because it focuses on adolescents that found themselves pressed into the war machinery in the last phase of World War II. <clears throat> no, it's not at all my intention to use the opportunity to advertise it to you, far from it. So I will not even show beyond what you see here, what we did and what pedagogical or didactical solution we found at a certain issue for a certain issue. Instead, I want to illustrate how some of the decisions that we made or the discussions that we found ourselves in were determined or at least influenced by the position within a network of actors involved in the production, apprehension and reception of the that said material that you see right here. To start with, I will just give you some really basic facts of the project. Um, Von der Schulbank in den Krieg, From School Desk to War, focuses on then 15 to 17 year old adolescents that were forcibly integrated into the German forces at the end of World War II during the phase of the so called total war called for by propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels on January 18, 1943. The basis for this, for our material, was an existing and published collection of 20 transcribed interviews with former, they're called Luftwaffenhelfer, that's Air Force Auxiliary, uh, that were enlisted to operate the flags, the infamous air defense artillery. There were about 200,000 of those, so 20 out of 200,000 had the chance to uh, recount their stories here. It's not quite clear how many of them perished in the war, but there was a considerable danger involved since they were quite exposed to being bombed. And yes, there were a lot of them that died. From these 20 interviews, more than 70 years after the events, and that would be a matter of discussion in itself, 70 years after the war, the, the interviews, we selected one, only one for the material. That was an interview with Karl Kling, who was born in 1928, who had been an air defense auxiliary and who witnessed and survived major Allied bombing raids on Augsburg and Memmingen. He lived on to become an engineer later in the West German Republic and a politician for the Christian Social Union, that is, if you don't know it, the Bavarian branch of the Merkel Party. Now, this all may sound pretty normal or ordinary, even ordinary to you. It may be considered just one more of these war experience educational materials. However, one can, of course, identify some possible fields of debate concerning the question whether this topic is suited and adequate to become a matter of historical learning in and out of school. So for the legitimation of an educational material like that. First of all, one could call into question whether soldiers of the Wehrmacht, as young as they were at the time, should be put into the foreground in an educational context, especially in Germany. If we think about, for example, Klaus Legevi, uh, who singled out seven particular fields of debate that dominate memory conflicts and uh, in, in Europe, and we all know those, the, the Shoah as a negative founding myth, um, uh, the Soviet communism versus uh, national socialism debate, uh, the question of migration, the question of colonialism. So all these very important issues within these one could argue whether uh, there aren't more important fields to be covered and examples to be covered, treated than the Air Force auxiliaries, young as they may, they may have been. 
connected to this question of standing within the memory discourse, one could consider it a problem that they, that to have chosen that particular focus entails the risk that students in Germany identify with those German adolescents, rather than, for example, with adolescent survivors of the concentration camps, which may be in German context then construed be as the others that were suffering. So it's a question of othering and identification, of course, that you can ask here. And finally, just to give uh, one important debate, um, especially in light of the uh, their, their, of the of the recent trials against the last uh, living perpetrators of the Holocaust, um, some of those auxiliaries were used as um, uh, guards against air raids in Auschwitz. So of course there's the questions. They were not included in the in the in the group of 20 that we had. But of course there's always the questions of victim and perpetrator even at that age. So there are some problems that of course need to be discussed in a material like this, or that you have to think about if you produce a material like that. However. Um, I now, my point today is I want to draw a similar chart like I showed you before for the production of this particular education material, just to show you, and this may, to, uh, may even surprise you, maybe not, who all is involved in such a production and who all gives their interest or, or, or um, has their positions that want to be heard. To start with, Florian and myself, uh, who are the producers of the material, um, we both were teachers at a time and we are both have a long time or for in a shorter time I have a longer time as university scholars so there is both a connection to teachers and to university. We were asked and given the task to produce by an NGO that is used to working together with federal agencies in Germany and it gets most of its funding from these agencies. Often there is some politician or some body in politics who has a certain idea that this or that topic would be nice to be covered and then the NGO tries to react to this. So there's not a direct influence, so there's not a politician that tells me what to do, but there is a basic, the basic direction of course is influenced by the political, uh, by the political force that tries within a democratic society of course that tries to have a certain topic being covered. Um, as a um, I was not, or we were not responsible for the design, so there was a designer, and he had his own, of course, interest in the creation in, of this material, like curators in the museum have, or the designers uh, of the uh, museum have. Um, the survivors, we didn't meet itself because we used this material. So in this, there, there are other materials, of course, where I work together with survivors of, of different um, atrocities, but in this particular case, there was no direct contact to the survivors. And there are, of course, speaking about participations, materials uh, where you have students that joined, but in this setting, there were, for example, no students involved at any time. Um, they were only thought of as the one group, especially teachers and students that would be reading this material or using this material. It was rather aimed at teachers though. Um, I want to just highlight some issues that arise from a setting like this, which might be, whoops, uh, which might be interesting to think about. There is in Germany a certain debate whether Luftwaffenhelfer air raid auxiliaries should really be called child soldiers, which puts them in a group with examples from, for example, Central Africa in the late 20th century or even early 21st century, which are really different in nature. However, these Air Force auxiliaries were younger than 18 and this just, they qualify for the term. But since the governmental funding of the project was based on the premise that we were all dealing with child soldiers, there was really for us as producers, no chance, no room to really avoid that term. So even if we had a different position, that was would have been something that we couldn't really have uh, decided differently, even if we had wanted to, and we discussed it by the way. As far as the concept of the educational pro approach is concerned, the NGO thought much of teachers, ex thinking about teachers' expectations, would have liked something that would have been much more ready to use in a classroom setting. From a university teacher's educator's perspective, I'm always, and we were always much more reluctant to follow that wish because we want to give teachers issues to think about rather than easy to cook recipes. So there was a 
concept, a conflict of interest, a slight conflict of interest. In this case, we won. However, this is the entire conflict was our don't even call it a conflict, the small debate was something that wouldn't have been there without this setting. Um, at a certain point, the designer and um, myself and Florian, we really would have liked to include a picture of Karl Kling in Luftwaffen uniform, Air Force uniform, and this picture exists, but we simply did not have it in the necessary quality. The NGO then, which had led the interviews, was responsible for the acquisition of the photograph, but simply did not manage to acquire a better quality version of the photo or even the rights of the photo. That's not quite, uh, one of the reasons was the old age of the survivor. When he was contacted, he didn't react anymore. And uh, later on, or, or briefly later on, he died. So uh, of course he couldn't really have given us the rights, but at this time, uh, this entire uh, setting led to us not being able to directly contact the survivor before his departure, before his passing. So in the end, we only used two pictures of ruined streets from the raid on Augsburg. Um, we decided not to use a picture of any uh, Luftwaffe uh, uniform, young adolescent soldier, or even a picture of, of a fallen soldier, just um, to, to keep the particular regional context. But the decision, the pictures that were really used in the uh, which pictures were used were not only uh, or, or the pictures the, the selection of pictures was not only due to our like pedagogical didactical decision but also to the to the circumstances that arise from the setting that you see here talking about the interviews we were stuck with the selection of these 20 interviews right from the start because that was what the ngo had in mind and that was the rights that they owned for these interviews. Most of them weren't really at all suited to being included in an educational material. And we were very lucky that Karl Kling's story worked for us. Most had a very nostalgic approach and Karl Kling was the only one who was in his interview uh, giving some reflection that where you can start with students to work on that. So here again, this entire setting is something that restricts maybe opens up possibilities. We wouldn't have had these interviews, but also it restricts us in our, in the way we produce our materials. There's one important factor to note, speaking of selectivity, one of the core decisions that we took as educators is, or that we always take as educators is of course, selecting the material. And here, one of our objectives, objectives would have been to uh, create diversity of course, if you have only one engineer, you, there's hardly a possibility to create a lot of diversity. But as a rule, we would have liked to create gender diversity. And there would have been uh, cases, there's, there's very, very many uh, women or young women, adolescent women that were involved in the war machinery. Uh, but the 20 interviews were all led with men, plus a matter of class. Um, we ended up using an engineer who became a politician. And I think that was, would have been something we wouldn't have done in another um, setting. My aim here was not to tell an anecdote about the genesis of a rather normal educational material, but to remind us of the importance of looking at, yeah, you may call it power structures in the production of these materials. And just to end with, um, it would be very interesting to compare it with a, another, um, um, with another uh, educational material on Kindersoldaten on child soldiers that was used more or less from the same material and uh, where another NGO, uh, the war crimes, uh, uh, the war the grave commission that you, people in Riga may know the German war grave commission uh, that also produced uh, um, a material. And there you could of course now compare it that there's for example, only two pictures. It's not one individual story. There's um, women involved. Um, however, uh, it, it would be very interesting not only to compare the differences in the material, but also the differences in the setting, the systemic setting. Here, for example, I would have been the um, educator. I'm, in, in, I'm on the advisory board of the Volksbund, um, on the scientific advisory board. I would not be in the role of the production, but I would be in the role of the one who would be uh, giving comments on whether to publish this material. So in this case, I would have been the one to say, okay, you need some 
uh, gender diversion here. But in the other case, where I was the producer itself, myself, although I was an educator, I'm a university educator, I was forced to find myself into this particular structure. So that was just uh, kind of like a call to always to always um, realize the the system in which we are working as educators, even when we are reflecting about the issues of education as we do in this conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for this really rich and uh, inspiring um, uh, presentation. Uh, raised a lot of uh, feelings and comments, I think. Uh, please, uh, any question, uh, any comment? Actually, uh, I have uh, one coming, uh, going back uh, to the starting point of your uh, presentation um, uh, about emotions, yeah, about rising uh, emotions of uh, children. And uh, actually, I, mm, I waited for answer. Yeah, uh, uh, in which age children uh, could be involved in uh, in these uh, very uh, very heavy uh, topics uh, of uh, of history, and I am uh, putting this question from my experience because that surprised me when I. Um, uh, get feedback from my students who work with uh, with with uh, sources. Uh, they asked me, uh, me completely unhistorical uh, uh, question. I, I I don't know how to put it, but they asked me. I would like to know how people survive in these very hard uh, times, and uh, it is. Uh, uh, question uh, which goes beyond of uh, borders, I think, but uh, we usually uh, use as uh, very strict uh, lecturers at the study uh, course we have to teach uh, history. And uh, how this our duty of uh, teachers is going together with this emotional side uh, of, of these materials? Um, well, thank you very much for this uh, for this comment and and question. Uh, first of all, my my own presentation here would not answer to your question, but would rather um, comment upon your question that the answers that we are finding for your questions are not only determined by our convictions as educators, but also by the systemic setting who all is involved in the discussions. That would be that would be the point from my my uh, as far as from the perspective of my contribution to this conference is concerned. But of course, I can something to the discuss can also say something to the discussion that you are referring to, uh, and this has got a lot of uh, facets that we cannot touch upon all in these uh, few minutes. Uh, just to to give you two or three idea or to to share two or three ideas. Um, firstly, this is a question that arises not only when it when we deal with suffering, of course, in death, but in all education with children, what's the role of emotion in learning? So that's especially in history, historical learning, that's very important. And that's a, a, an ongoing discussion with, as you know, as be better than I do, uh, with all the facets that we have. So this is the background for this question, of course. Um, from this perspective, there is a, a reluctancy to use uh, atrocities and the war stories at a younger age. However, talking about uh, public history, the counter argument always is children and adolescents, especially children and adolescents, will have by the age of 10 have um, gotten a lot of knowledge, well, it's not knowledge, but of, of pieces of knowledge of these atrocities uh, by uh, means of uh, communication beyond education, media, parents, um, storytelling by relatives, 
Um, everybody knows, uh, I, I would say everybody, well, that would be a good question if you just go in and ask 10, 10 year olds uh, what they know about the first, if they know the Second World War. Uh, sometimes in Germany I do this and sometimes they do not really at that age or even later ages uh, distinguish between like the, the Nazi times and the communist times. Yeah, so there is an inter, you know that as well, of course, there's a big inter mixing uh, of all this going on, even if people are much older than uh, child. child age um, but so uh, they, they will they will be the, the emotions will be there so as educators I think we have to see what do our what do the children and our lessons we work with what do they think what's what's their pre-knowledge what what are the feelings they attach to the pictures that already have so we cannot um, act as if we meet tabula rasa um, empty vacuum uh, minds that we just can fill, of course, but we have to work with, with what's there. And of course, for that, we have to know what's there. And it's very difficult because the political convictions are already there that are combined with these historical events before any rationalization takes place. And there were some very disturbing, I would say, stories um, uh, uh, not stories, uh, studies being made um, where you saw that, for example, even have you, if you have a, a rational approach um, that, that was a very intense uh, multifaceted triangulation study, for example, that showed uh, that even if you have a, a very rational approach, if you even if you work with uh, images and and um, work with the images they have of the time, uh, that they will um, have a certain reflection for for a month or two but if you ask them half a year later and have group discussions a year later you see that they will disconnect their their school experience and even the value education maybe value education but the uh, the education that the reflexive value education they had will not really uh, in the long term really affect the convictions that are concerned uh, that are tied to their um, to the to the pictures they have of the past, but, but this is what we always work with, and we all know that uh, education is a long road. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It really raised a lot of uh, uh, questions for uh, for me as well. So, Maria, please, uh, you have a question. Well, it's not a question. It's more a comment uh, in, to the to the in presentation we had just listened in relation with uh, and, and a comment to you, Iveta, in relation with the idea of how children feel with all these images and uh, and of war and destruction. Um, when two years ago, I, I had organized the, the exhibition about education in Madrid. It was a part of the war. And the main problem with the designers of the exhibition and the stakeholders was if we could show photographs of dead children, dead uh, children in Madrid because the bombing. We had a very big discussion about that. And then I had, uh, because the stakeholders were saying that, and the designers, they were saying that they will not going to take the responsibility of uh, making a child completely stressed or, or creating him a traumatic impression, etc. And then I had looked for the advice of a psychologist, of a um, childhood uh, a developmental psychologist. And he was saying to me, well, the children should see that. They should see the horrors of the world and the most close image for seeing the horrors is to see the children because that they will understand it. So, okay, at the end, we had photographs of the children and we also were uh, putting a visitor book, a visitor book in the exhibition where the, everybody could write comments. And the children, I, I did not work on them yet, the children had written very thoughtful comments about the world. And then you see that they connect the world with the dead children. This is this was they are they are close uh, uh, connection, and, and this was their story. They had make up their story with 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 children of of the past. And simply, I wanted to comment that. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Yeah, uh, Oliver, please, you have any comments? 
Well, well, thank you for for that comment. And of course, that is something. Uh, whenever we are talking about mass atrocities, that is something that we think about in in a museum context as well, as you know. Um, and for example, the, in, in a museum, you have different ways of presenting it. You can avoid enlarging it uh, to a huge format. Have it in the original format. You can you can distance. You can put in some distance. There's there's all kinds of things you can do in a museum. Um, but what you what what we always have to remember is um, that in the internet age, um, children usually have seen pictures like that and have made a competition out of seeing that. So the the, the situation is different than like say 40 years ago when p children wouldn't, but well, maybe they should, but but not on this scale would have had access to all kinds of pictures. So at this time, I think we should rather uh, frame these or or frame these pictures than simply avoid it avoid them but that's that's a debate uh, yes thank you very much and i think that uh, uh, the next presentation very much goes in line with our debate and therefore i am giving floor to uh, evita feldenthale uh, from the museum of the occupation of latvia please uh, evita floor is yours so hello can you see my presentation yeah, it works well. Yes. So, okay, thank you. And firstly, I want to thank to the organizers of the conference for giving me a chance to present today. And as far as you can see, I am representing the audiovisual archive of the Museum of Occupation of Latvia. And I want you to introduce you to the video testimony collection, which also contains stories about childhood. Yes, uh, there you can see the content of my presentation where I will try uh, to introduce you to the video testimonies as a source and more to the part where it and how it touches the childhood. For now, I am the head of the audiovisual archive and I need to explain that the museum is a private museum. It was founded in 1993. Uh, and at the same time, when the museum was founded, uh, the normal collection everyone is used to was also uh, founded uh, where all the photographs, documents, artifacts, and other things are stored. But the audiovisual archive, on another hand, was uh, founded in 1994 when the first audio testimonies were recorded. But from 1996, when the first video camera was obtained, the collection of video testimonies was started. There you can see the content of the audiovisual archive for now. It consists of audio testimonies, uh, approximately of 70 hours, more than 500 video materials or commemoration events and other things, for example, op opening of the books and such things. There is also a small part of film documents. Uh, we continue to digitize the content, so I'm not uh, talking about it further, but it could also contain uh, filmed uh, childhood uh, things like celebrations and other things. But uh, uh, the part of collection I am going to talk today is the video testimonies. And as, as far as you can see, for now, we have 2,424 video testimonies, or it takes more than 4,500 hours to see all of them. Uh, and uh, we still continue to gather video testimonies, so the size of the collection is still growing. There you can see the development of technical possibilities used by the audiovisual archive. In 2015, uh, entire collection of video testimonies was digitized. Uh, it consisted of super VHS and mini DV cassettes. Uh, copies of every video testimony are also available at the library of the Stanford University in the United States. Now we turn to video testimonies and as a historical source, we define video testimony as a narrative or life story of a person whose life was dramatically influenced by the Soviet and or 
Nazi occupation policies. There can you see very few uh, portraits of our interviewees. And if I need to keep close to the topic we are talking about today, we need to remember that all these people once have been young or children. Of course, most people given video testimonies to us are Latvians, but there are also people with different nationalities, including Russians, Jews, Ukrainians, Germans, Estonians, and few others. The same can be said about languages used by interviewees. Most are in Latvian, uh, but there are also video testimonies in Russian, English, German, uh, even one in Swedish and few more languages. Interesting to mention that uh, video testimony collection have been uh, obtained not only in Latvia, but my colleagues ha also have been to United States twice, United States twice, Germany, Canada, United Kingdom, and even to Krasnoyarsk Oblast in Russia to interview those who did not return after uh, deportation. And she even met the Latvians who already chose to go to Krasnoyarsk Oblast even before um, uh, deportations took place. Uh, if I need to talk more specifically about the length of the uh, video testimonies, then the shortest is around 15 minutes long. The longest takes 18 hours, but uh, don't worry, it wasn't taken in one day. My colleagues visited the man a few, a few times to film these 18 hours. But the average length, I would say, is three hours. For now, we have started to transcribe video testimonies in full length. This could be uh, there. We could say thanks to this uh, pandemic situation when our museum guides could not do their job. So we al allow them or uh, ask them to do some other jobs. So we even offer them to transcribe video testimonies. Uh, but I need to admit that. Uh, Transcribing them in full length is a really complicated and time consuming process. But for now, all data from all video testimonies is uh, uh, taken out, like we chose the main metadata to enter into database. So the content of all video testimonies is searchable. Uh, we try to define the main topic of every video testimony. And sometimes it is really challenging process because people living in Latvia in 20th century have experienced a lot. As far as you can Im Im imagine, uh, topics uh, are mainly connected to topic mentioned in the name of the museum, occupation and repressions. More precise, large portion of video testimonies cover mass deportations in 1941 and 1949. Those are deportees, collaborators, and bystanders. Uh, if we go deeper, then I can mention that most of the people interviewed about first mass deportation in 1941 were kids at that time. So mainly this topic is covered by children or deportation is well described by youngsters. Situation is a bit different about second mass deportation in 1949, where uh, there is equal number of deported children and adults, so there are both perspectives. When it comes to Holocaust, we have very few video testimonies, including one where Boy tells his memories about saving one Jew from Vikernik forest where the shooting took place. Latvian soldiers in Second World War, uh, besides legionaries and soldiers in Red Army, also includes young boys who were members of auxiliary staff of the German Luftwaffe during Second World War. Uh, national resistance movement in general also includes youth resistance movement members who were sentenced and sent to Gulag. We have video testimonies from those brave uh, women and men. Latvians in exile also include not only those who left Latvia mainly in 1944, but also those children who were already born in exile, later being active members of youth organizations who did 
a lot of things to remind Western society that Baltic states were once an independent state. Then uh, we have a special part of collection devoted to children born of war, or the main thing is that uh, their mother was Latvian, but father a uh, soldier of Red Army uh, or Nazi Germany armed forces. This part of collection is now under research. Uh, Oskar Gruzinsch from the Faculty of Social Sciences of University of Latvia is writing his PhD on this topic. Uh, then we have also a few video testimonies where men talk about their experiences during the Afghanistan war. There are also other topics covered I haven't mentioned, but uh, in some cases, as I, al I already said, it is very difficult to uh, tell the main topic of video testimony because there are people who have uh, been deported twice. There are members of national resistance movement which have survived Gulag and so on. At the same time, we have a quite large number of video testimonies of people who have not been repressed, but they have seen important historical events or their relatives have been repressed. When it comes to childhood as a topic in video testimonies, we were quite surprised uh, for amount of information it contains. We will never divide it as uh, one of our main topics, but at the same time, there have been a lot of children who have experienced important historical events as part of their childhoods. And then you could ask me, why do we, we even cover the topic of childhood? Answer is easy, and there I need to say thanks to my colleagues who have been working for this collection from very beginning. They used methodology where the person at the beginning of the conversation is asked to talk about their families and first childhood memories. This is done not only to get the context of repressions, for example, why family was deported, but also to open the person. Most of those people have never talked in front of cameras, so it is important to make them feel comfortable and get used to being filmed. Talking about things uh, they enjoy remembering also allow uh, to happen it faster. As I already mentioned previously, through video testimonies, we have chance to see important historical events through the eyes of ordinary people, including children. Some people also admit talking to us about things they have never talked to anyone anyone before. I also need to mention that we also ask people to show their photo albums so we could have illustrations in case if we would use the film material uh, to make it more interesting. For example, person talking about uh, their grandmother while showing the picture of her. We scan those pictures and there you, and there are a lot of illustrations of childhood in different times. I chose some pictures for you to see an examples like school, sports, toys, pets, work, reading, leisure, fashion at that time, kindergarten, parents, teachers, garden, monuments, Latvia, countries of exile, forced resettlement places, celebrations, hobbies, portraits, group pictures, everyday life, excursions, and many other things. When it comes to examples of childhood in stories uh, in video testimony collection, I want you to know about the project we made together with the educational department of the museum. We chose fragments of video testimonies to represent five historical periods in Latvia's uh, history of 20th century. If you want to see full uh, video of the project, look for it on YouTube, Childhood, Five Stories About. Those fragments also allow us to see interesting historical aspects of the history through the eyes of children. For example, now I am doing research on people born in, on for, forced resettlement. Those are Latvians who were born to their deported parents. It is interesting to see their attitude towards Latvia to choose uh, to those children born outside of it. 
When asked if they ever wanted to move to Latvia, answers varies. Some wanted, some did not. This was connected to the fact if their parents ever told them how they got uh, deported to Siberia. The same was with will and possibility to learn Latvian language in forced resettlement and the language of school when returning to Latvia. At least in one case, woman admitted that her family chose her to send to school with Russian language uh, of studies. Thus, she uh, admitted that she was Russified. On, an, on another case, those people acknowledged that they were used to their lives and childhood experiences in Siberia, that they really did not want to move to Latvia. Even after they were already living in Latvia, there, were, there was at least one example of boy who invited parents to move back to Siberia or to his motherland, not to stay in his uh, parents' motherland. When it comes to more precise examples, I will use people we already used in the project video I talked before. We divided history of Latvia in five part defining the interwar period, World War II, post-war period, and second Soviet occupation period, and uh, finished with the period of national awakening. Uh, thus, I can, uh, I can uh, confirm that there is no childhood history after the 90s or after Latvia regained um, independence. From the interwar period, I chose Olitis Madness excerpt, where she recalls nice memories from her childhood when all family members spent time together during weekends. Father was uh, father really enjoyed music. He played piano and also was a member of choir. Family was deported in 1941. Uh, father was separated from family and sent to Gulag and died. Children never saw him again. Olita was deported for second time in 1951 after she and her brother returned to Latvia in 1946 when children were allowed to return. There you can see Olita while giving her video testimony on Olita when she was a, a kid. From the period of Second World War, I chose episodes from Valentin Skalnich where he describes life right next to the Wittgernik forest where, where the Jews were killed during Holocaust. Besides this episode, he also described the time when kids who naturally were curious went to the place where Jews were shot, and he even recalled that they helped one Jew to escape the pit. He stayed alive, had no clothes, so boys gave him their trousers so he could escape the forest. Valentines don't recall ever ever seeing him again. As a kid, he also talked about food shortage during Nazi Germany occupation period. From the post-war period, uh, I chose excerpt from the video testimony of Jürgen Sienertz. His father was a German soldier he only met for the first time in 2008. Until 2008, his father was not aware of the existence of his son in Latvia. Post-war period for children and childhood in general was complicated. Surroundings were full, full of ammunition and children were playing with it. And there, was, there were often cases when those games ended badly. Juris recalls losing his friend who blew up. Up till nowadays, Juris uh, remembers the last words of his friend, don't tell mother which shows that children were aware that playing was dangerous and at the same time, busy parents could not pay maximum amount of attention to their kids because of complicated living conditions. Before telling his, this episode in front of camera, Yuri turned to his mother, which was in the same room as him, and for the first time confessed seeing this episode. Another man uh, who gave video testimony to the museum recalled that his family even moved from place where ammunition was easily available to another place so the mother would not be stressed about possible accidents while kids were playing with ammunition. 
from uh, the excerpts of Second Soviet period, I chose episodes from the video testimony of San Tiro. Through the eyes of children, she shows the dualism of the Soviet state, which was atheistic, but at the same time, older generation or her grandparents, grandparents still went to the church and chose to baptize uh, her granddaughter while well, she was already the member of the communist youth organization. Of course, we cannot avoid comparison to nowadays and children life now and how it has changed from time to time. From the period of Nas Latvian national awakening and the restoration of independence of Latvia, I chose fragment from the video testimony of Oskar Gruzinch, where he admits that one of his first childhood memories is connected to barricades. For him as a kid, this meant only that his father was not at home, not the importance of the barricades in general. And who could blame a five-year-old for that? Uh, his later memories are connected to comical memory of receiving a package from the United States with content unknown for that time for Soviet people. Mother tried to cook cereal. This also showed the random content of children's memories, which followed them for the rest of their lives. When it comes to conclusion, I want to uh, say thanks once again for the possibility to introduce broader public with the contents of the audiovisual archive of the Museum of Occupation of Latvia. The collection is one of uh, the biggest, if not so, in the Europe in covered topics. And the childhood uh, stories are not the main aim of the video testimonies, but those come to us because of used methodology, which helps us to open the people. Only in cases when people have experienced episodes about repressions toward them or their family members, when they have been young, we ask them to talk about it in the first hand. Usage of those sources uh, or video testimonies is not limited. We follow that our collection from technical point of view is available for use as fast as possible. And for now, material is being used for documentaries, research, different articles, and so on. Biggest limitation so far is the main language of uh, video testimonies. It is Latvian, but if you are really interested in the topic, we, uh, we can manage translations, at least to those fragments you are interested in. If we ignore the fact that the state of emer emergency doesn't allow us to continue our main work for now, we continue to film video testimonies. This year we have done 14 so far, but the list of people willing to talk to us is still long. The same could be said about Dutch topics. In terms of childhood, it will grow and expand. More and more people are talking about their childhood experiences during Soviet occupation period. I want to say thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edita, uh, about this um, uh, presentation, which shows how rich uh, is Museum of uh, Occupation here uh, in, 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 in Latvia. Uh, please, uh, Oliver, I think you rise at uh, the first hand and then, uh, then Mark. Please, uh, Oliver. Thank you. Um... Uh, I was really intrigued by this collection. I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of collection like well, there are some very notable collections like these, but this I think is a very interesting one, especially because of the long strength of time that you have uh, there. Um, I, I would like to learn more about the interaction between your educational up department and um, the archive. Like, who is responsible? Who who takes the initiative? Who decides on? Do we take only like what elements do we take? How is the interaction? And who is the uh, who is the the receiver of that information? Are it students, the general public? Uh, so, uh, as a, I work in the audiovisual department, we are responsible for the content. So the educational department comes to us and asks for content. So if they are asking for childhood, we are giving them the childhood. Okay. 
Yeah, but this was very specific project. Uh, we started it because of state of emergency. We could not accept uh, those, those visitors. So we had to think about something new. So we made those five stories. Uh, this is childhood. It is meant also for, for children. It is history at the same time. So we, uh, we got this. This project was quite successful. We think so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, Mark, please, your question. Yeah, uh, very short. Uh, two questions. And the first is in the same line uh, of the one of Oliver. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that it is a private museum. So my idea is, if it is not too indiscreet, follow the money who is paying for this museum. And the second one, do you have any information? Because there has been, and I mentioned it in my paper, a whole discussion in Belgium and Flanders because of a monument, the Latvian uh, monument, the Beehave in Zedelheim, which was, uh, where was the place of... Uh, uh, a prisoner's camp of uh, Latvian people that fought in the Second World War on the side of the Germans. They... Also, uh, the museum is uh, private and uh, the main income source is... Uh, 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 so, I forgot the, the word in English. So, we, we receive money yeah. from people who are willing to donate, yeah, those are donations. Donation. The, main, the main source of income from this private museum is There is uh, no sponsor. Donations. There is no sponsor, big uh, American or what, whatever. No, 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 we have a lot of small sponsors, if we can say so. We mm -hmm. have those, like, for example, uh, educational department of museum is uh, sponsored by those donators who chose to donate to educational purposes, then audiovisual archive receives money from those who donate it for our video testimonies and so on. Okay. Yeah, and if we talk about the Beehive, I was uh, part of the project when it was uh, made and I was also there when it was opened. And I actually have no idea how far uh, it is how far the situation has gone because there were ideas that they want to uh, take it off. So well, they, they, they now ask a specialist to research the, the question, but the, the whole, and that's a good example of what I call the instrumentalization of uh, representation in, in, in museums and, and commemorate sites. Uh, there, there is a political part, or there are on, on the extreme right in Belgium some political parties that uh, the ancestors of them were in, 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 the, in the legion that, that fought in the, in, with the Germans uh, for, for the so called Flemish question and the uh, Flemish emancipation of the people, the, the, the German brothers, and, and so on. So there, there have been some SS legion. There was a Flanders SS legion in Germany. Uh, and uh, some people make the analogy with the collaborators and the traitors in, in Belgium and those people of Latvia who were forced to uh, fight in, in, in in Germany. And that's why the, the, the historical context and going back to the sources and to the uh, historical um, duty of contextualization is in my eyes, to my eyes, so important. But that's uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much. Any uh, other comments or or, or questions? Uh, Jaren, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask the question: How you notice bigger interest uh, um, amongst visitors to watch these um, video testimonies? Um, how popular is it? Is it popular amongst all visitors or? Um, is there more interest among, among researchers who can get better audio of the, um, of the 
time period on help um, these videos testimonies? Uh, so uh, firstly, we use the video testimonies as a part of exhibitions. Like uh, this is the source uh, which was used in KGB building, which was used in the uh, exhibition in Rhine Bulvaris 7. And now we are working on a new exhibition. So there will be like 11 topics out of 11 topics. Video testimonies will be used in four, in at least four of them. So if you come to the museum, you see uh, videos. So you have naturally interest if we, if we can see something more. Then we have those fragments on our YouTube channel, so people uh, can find them and get to know them. And then uh, a lot of researchers come to us, and a lot of those who are finding out that their family members have been uh, interviewed, so they can have a copies of video testimonies. So we are also working, uh, cooperating with the Faculty of History and Philosophy and the Social Science Faculty. So every semester, at least two groups of students are coming to us and we are giving insight on what we are doing and what's the content of our collection. So we are also, this is the, the way how I can get to other people who don't know about us. So if you are interested in our collection, so you can get in touch with me. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very, uh, very much. And I, uh, I think that uh, we deserve lunch and we will meet uh, at uh, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Riga's time uh, uh, after our lunch break for the third session. Thank you. Uh, thank you and see you at two. I think now it is time to give the floor and I'm very happy with that to Professor Angelo Van Hort with whom I have worked uh, since decades. Uh, Angelo is a professor for Historische Erziehungs- und Bildungsforschung at the University of Koblenz Landau at the campus in Landau. Angelo, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so now you should be able to see my screen. Um, well, first of all, also from my side. Um, uh, Angelo, that, uh, we don't yeah? uh, see your screen. I have to give it um, now. Now you should see it. Yeah. Sorry, I had to push, push one more button, um, <laughs> overlooked it. Um, so first, also to you, uh, Iveta, um, from my side, many thanks for putting such an effort in organizing this. And it's really a pity indeed that we cannot meet in person. Um, um, I, will, I will immediately start my presentation. Um, after another presentation at Ishe, uh, a colleague asked me why I had become so obsessed with uh, the city of Gary, Indiana, in the United States. At first, I was shocked, uh, but suddenly I realized that she most likely was right. My presentation today explains why I have become so passionate about Gary. Wait, otherwise I cannot look, okay. I will use different levels of meaning of the concept wasteland to structure the first part of my presentation, which offers a brief introduction into the Gary case, a study some of you have heard about at other conferences. In the second and largest part of my presentation, I will enter a discussion opening up possibilities for what Ian Grosvenor has labeled a, part a participatory turn in the history of education with references um, to social pedagogy, community building, public history, as well as the notion of an engaged university or more specifically, a socially engaged history of education. What I present today also connects to what one may call an ecological way of thinking. As I would like to explore 
And to take this approach further, I decided together with Ian Grosvenor, among others, to establish an international research group on history of educational ecologies, um, about which you will learn more in the near future. Part one, wastelands of Gary, from natural to urban wasteland. Gary's history is inextricably bound up with both the heyday and the decline of the steel industry in the United States. Gary arose as a new steel town in 1906 after the US Steel Company had acquired land in Lake County, Indiana, along the southern shore of Lake Michigan, almost 30 miles southeast of Chicago. The town became a symbol of urban industrial America. It was hailed as a huge technical miracle and a new industrial utopia. Gary's steel making facilities were to be not only the world's largest at the time, but also the most modern using the latest methods and technology. Because of its mushroom growth, Gary was labeled or was called America's magic city of steel. Soon after it was founded, Gary became a town of mostly Eastern and Southern European working class immigrants. Its dramatic growth did not prevent Gary from becoming a typical American city or, like the historian Paul O'Hara phrased it, even the most American of all American cities. It was in this context that Gary's superintendent of schools, William Wirt, had the advantage of having a virgin field in which to work. One might also call it an educational wasteland. The public education system Wirt introduced, usually referred to as the Gary Plan, is one of the most telling examples of progressive education in the United States. It has been discussed extensively in American scholarship on educational history. The most distinctive feature was the so-called work-study play plan or platoon system, a way of doubling the capacity of the schools by taking advantage of the fact that when one group of pupils was using the auditoriums, shops, laboratories, and playgrounds, another group could make use of the classrooms. Essentially, the Gary plan represented an effort to apply to an urban school system Dewey's idea of education as an embryonic community life. Emphasis was on the school as a social clearinghouse for the neighborhood. It is not without reason then that the Gary Plan is the most comprehensive example of schools discussed by Dewey and his daughter Evelyn in Schools of Tomorrow, published in 1915. The Gary Plan also materialized into huge E-shaped buildings that were perceived as ideal school plans. Because of the pub publicity and support by scholars and opinion makers like Dewey, the platoon system spread rapidly in the United States. In 1961, the American historian of education, Lawrence Kremen, wrote that, quote, by 1916, it seems fair to say that most progressives, if asked to cite the leading example of progressive education, would probably have mentioned Gary, end of quote. However, the platoon system would soon disappear from the national scene and the Gary plan itself began to unravel in the 1930s and was soon dismantled afterwards death, death in 1938. It lasted in some form or another until 1960 when the system finally died. Ironically, the school plans once hailed as ideal were either closed or demolished around the time of Gary's centennial. The historian Bill Rees once wrote that, quote, the historian's job is to ensure that we remember what too many people forget. He made this statement in 1990, when many citizens, he wrote, may think of Gary as only, quote, one of America's numerous northern Rust Belt cities, its schools impaired by familiar urban ills resulting from the legacy of racial discrimination and poverty amidst a collapsing economy. 
end of quote. Indeed, like other once thriving centers of manufacturing, Gary ultimately became a ghost town. Today, Gary is a city plagued by physical decay, joblessness, concentrated poverty, and racial isolation. Houses are crumbling and lots lie empty. Whole rows of shops and stores are boarded up and graffiti covered. A blaze that swept through downtown Gary in October 1997 destroyed landmark buildings. Gary made a journey from urban heyday to decay, from utopia to dystopia, from natural to urban wasteland. As a post-industrial city, it returned to its pre-industrial state with a touch of rust. The white population, still comprising 80% of the population in 1930, dropped to 10% by 2000. Simultaneously, Gary's African-American population grew exponentially from less than 20% during the 1930s to almost 80% today. The population, which peaked at approximately 178,000 in 1960, has decreased to approximately 75,000 today. This demographic decline cannot be explained by economic factors only. Strikingly, a decisive factor in this process was the election in 1967 of Richard Gordon Hatcher, the city's first black mayor. Fear of a city run by a black mayor led many white residents to leave Gary. It was the moment that Gary became a black city. Today, Gary is even the most segregated city in the United States. This brings me to the second and largest part of my presentation, a discussion. The stark contrast between the Gary of the first half of the 20th century and the Gary of today has irritated and stimulated me at the same time. That is exactly the reason why Gary has become an obsession to me. In my Ghent years, when I started to explore Gary's history, I tended to be hopeful about Gary's future. It may sound naive, but without a ray of hope, a socially driven academic engagement is impossible. It was O'Hara's book I referred to earlier, in which he explains the different constructed narratives about Gary. Um, which initially convinced me that there might be hope for Gary. However, the uncovering of those narratives, as O'Hara argued, will be essential. Quote, if we realize how we have chosen to speak about Gary, we can see that, that connection and perhaps free um, the city from these burdens. Understanding social construction frees us to reinvent reinterpret and reshape, end of quote. Because of the familiar, familiarity with social pedagogy gained in the meantime, particularly that last sentence appealed to me. At Ghent University, I was not only in charge of courses on history of education, but also of, co on, of courses on cultural heritage, as well as on social, cultural and socio-artistic work with special attention to community engagement. It is the reason why Arthur Naparstek, an expert, an expert on urban redevelopment and neighborhoodization, caught my attention as his plea for partnership in order to make democracy real was based on his experience in the late 1960s when he worked in Gary as an assistant to Mayor Hatcher. Naparstek would call it, quote, one of our fundamental mistakes that policies have not focused on people, end of quote. And he defined in the tradition of the Chicago School of Sociology, the small community neighborhood as the locus for service delivery. In contrast, urban exploring of which you can find many, many, many images online, focuses on ruins, not on people, and therefore contributes to constructing narratives that do not seem to help Gary to revitalize, since monuments are, 
quote, the part of its fabric that most represent a city and define the emotional life of a city, end of quote. Yet, taking into account that Gary counts many landmark buildings as witness to a glorious industrial past, we need to be aware that those buildings are also the physical record of its history. Monuments therefore hold a strong potential for revitalization, but if the money and the will are lacking for a reconstruction, it remains difficult to free Gary from its burdens. It particularly becomes difficult when taking a relational understanding of space into account, referring to both the spatial organization of the social and the social organization of spaces. However, as much as such a spatial turn matters, also history matters, as John Tosh emphasized, advocating for engagement by academic historians in the public sphere. Indeed, historians have a role to play in this insofar they pay attention to such a relational understanding of space and help to construct alternative narratives. In the History Manifesto, Joe Galdi and David Armitage argue that historians, quote, should recognize that how they tell the story of the past shapes how the present understands its potential and is thus an intervention in the future of the world, end of quote. They connect this with the concept of a public feature, a future, which calls for a collective engagement with the big picture, a task that requires us to look backwards as well as ahead. The sword of history, so they argue, has two edges. One that cuts open new possibilities in the future as also one that cuts through the noise, contradictions, and lies of the past. Goldie and Armitage combined this statement with a plea for a return of the longue durée, which has been a concern in my study of Gary, spanning more than 100 years of history. However, a question is as to who is concerned and how and who is the us in this. In answering these questions, I am much indebted to the British approach to public history, which emphasizes its democratic potential and its social reform agenda, and considers it as, quote, a process by which the past is constructed into history and a practice which has the capacity for involving people as well as nations and communities in the creation of their own histories, end of quote. In this approach, a participatory model is central. This reflects also a history from below, in which the possibility of history made by people, not by academic historians alone, holds the potential of a social form of knowledge. A public history that takes this as a starting point and combines it with an interdisciplinary and collaborative approach may provide may provide us with new ways of understanding the past as well as the present. It requires an academic engagement, a history that intervenes in public debate and that connects with individual experience and imaginative perception. Moreover, when injected in both research and academic education, this approach to history allows an engaged university that connects the academy, including students, with society and with communities, including schools. Here, public history connects with a social pedagogy agenda that renounces a classic social work perspective that starts from a social understanding of citizenship. Such a conception tends to see plurality and difference predominantly as a problem, something that troubles um, and threatens the stability of society, and therefore as something that needs to be addressed and to a certain extent even needs to be overcome. It generates a discourse of a disintegrating society as is exactly what happened in the case of Gary and by extension in many historical accounts on the racial makeup of the United States. However, the problem with such a social understanding of citizenship is that it has been dominant in educational history as well. 
and connects with the concept of social engineering, which focuses on top-down processes that aim at improving the efficiency of education systems and are oriented towards economies of scale and safeness. What we need instead, both thematically and as a methodological approach, is a focus on social imaginary. It is a blend word of imagination and engineering and aims at changing existing situations into preferred ones by making use of the imagination of all involved actors who are all potentially involved as co-creators. The concept of imagineering is particularly, particularly related to complicated and complex issues, so-called wicked problems, that are difficult or impossible to solve. To cope with an unsolvable problem, such as poverty and racism, for instance, is then no longer a question of fixing the past, but requires reinventing and recreating the future together. Imagineering calls for connectivity in society, for thinking and acting in terms of evolution instead of solutions. With a social pedagogy perspective, it shares the idea that small interventions can result in big effects and challenge the status quo of society. In that regard, social imaginary, uh, imagineering potentially rather connects with the political understanding of citizenship, in which plurality and difference are seen as the very raison d'etre of democratic processes and practices, and therefore as what needs to be protected and cultivated. What is needed to make this happen is, quote, the dependence of social reorganization upon educational reconstruction, as Dewey phrased it in Democracy and Education. It signifies a society in which every person shall be occupied in something which makes the lives of others better worth living and which accordingly makes the ties which bind persons together more perceptible, which breaks down the barriers of distance between them. Do we want, however, that we are far from such a social state and added that in a literal and qualitative sense, we may never arrive at it. End of quote. However, it may be, instead of letting fade the last glimmer of hope for Gary, it is our moral duty, I think, to emphasize time and again that there is more wasteland to be cultivated in order to eventually turn Gary into an arena for learning democracy. As Lawrence Kremen wrote, referring to the motto on the Great Seal of the United States, democracy becomes the persistent quest for the more perfect union. A kind of continuing social process of e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And it's exactly this quest that makes it worth to connect past, present, and future. Let me conclude with some remarks on my future agenda. So far, my research has been limited to a very extensive literature um, review and discussion or reflection on related issues that I presented today. I might now decide to keep this at a theoretical level and apply aspects of it to case studies closer to home. That is also the intention, as this is possible in the context of project seminars that I offer in our master's program for which I'm discussing possibilities for public outreach uh, with the City Museum and Archive in Lando. The idea is to build a bridge to local communities through public history projects and to present output from these projects in the City Museum or in other public places, such as the University Library. But Gary won't let go of me. I had hoped to be able to tell you something about it today, but I haven't gotten that far yet. The aim is to get in touch with colleagues at the University of Gary, there is a university in Gary, who, which is no co coincidence, of course, are highly engaged in local communities. And I want to enter into a dialogue with them, present my ideas, and then we will see what comes out of that. In other words, this chapter is not yet closed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelo, for this engaged speech, which is, I think, uh, very exciting for, for us, for all of us. 
And I hope there are uh, some questions as we have still some time for discussion. To whom may I give the floor? Iveta, this is... No, no, no. I just... It's hope close, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oliver, uh, please is rising hand. Yeah. Oliver, yes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Angela, for this intriguing lecture, uh, which I really found fascinating, the approach as well as, as the, the example. Um, uh, as you can understand from, from the perspective that I presented in my own uh, presentation, I'm always looking at, at uh, well, or, or Mark said something about how the money flows uh, or follow the money. Um, I just wondered my experience from, from other towns, especially here in Germany, but in other towns as well, is that um, the, the participatory aspect of, of for example, uh, public history projects in which universities are involved, but also if it's only the, the civil society sector, uh, that still government funding has a central and pivotal role so that the participation is very often either only um, made possible through government funding or even then um, guided or, or put into a certain direction by government funding. How, how do you see this entire complex, if, if mm. this uh, possible in, within a few words? Sorry for that. Well, it's, 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 thank, it, 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 thank you for your question. Um, and, and you're right. It's, it's, um, it's an issue we have to deal with. Um, and that's, that's also something that, um, that was, became very, uh, a very central concern um, at the time when I was still at the Ghent University. We didn't have any projects really uh, on this matter, but um, of course I became aware that funding in the in these sectors uh, of cultural heritage, etc., well, it's limited and it's it's mostly uh, driven by very short projects. And then and then the question is always, what will be next uh, as soon as the project is finished? Uh, there, there's not really a very stable uh, context uh, usually uh, to, 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 to continue such projects. And this is a problematic issue when working with communities or trying to, 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 to build connections between the academy and, and communities. Uh, in, in what I presented here, it's very, at the moment, it's still very open to me. Um, of course, I'm intending uh, within this context, I referred to at the very beginning with this new international research group on, on the history of educational ecologies to, to apply for funding. And this is what I presented today. It's only one uh, possible uh, topic to, to, to bring further within this context, but we have, we have also other projects or themes, topics we are working on. Uh, but I see it at the moment much smaller and it's related to what I um, uh, told you at the very end of my presentation, which um, luckily is possible within the context of our study program, within the master's program, where um, the, 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 the bigger part of the program is um, um, consisting of project seminars, so kind of workshops, a workshop character you can install and 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 uh, do. I really work on small projects with students, and um, um, there it's already becoming. But that's on a very local. Uh, it's very local, of course. When I discussed this with the, the local uh, museum and archive, uh, they offered this solution to present. Um, possible outcome of, of such projects, small scale projects um, uh, at the museum. And um, we already had, but this this is not something I did. Um, my colleague Susanna Speaker did this and she had a small exhibition at the university library. So this is the only possibility I'm thinking of at the very moment, which is uh, which doesn't require so much funding. Uh, uh, so the money is less of a problem within that context for us uh, right now. But of course, when you see the bigger picture, when you see it bigger, when you see it more ambitious, then of course, uh, funding is really um, yeah, more problematic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh, Maria, Maria, please. Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> oh, Christoph, yes. sorry. Uh, I have, um, Angelo, I have listened to you speaking several times about. I know, uh, yes, yes, yes. Pro probably it was me, the one that I was saying while you were so. Um, no, 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 it wasn't you. 
No, but uh, I was thinking in it. <laughs> and uh, I had two questions. The first question is, you have ever been in, 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 in the city, in Gary? You have ever been? Or, or everything is from our uh, lectures? Because maybe the reality gives you a different impression. And the second one is, I had the impression that you use the, the platoon system that goes in Gary a bit as a pretext, uh, as a pretext, uh, as a, um, just as an excuse for going to, to a much more further project. But the, the pedagogical part of uh, this project is, uh, well, like a, well, a bit uh, abandoned. Mm. And I think that you had said that the, 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 the platoon system was finished in the 60s, uh, but it was very influential in all the years before. And do you think that uh, uh, this educational model and this educational organization of the school was influencing in a way um, in the development of the city or not? Because if the, the, the model, the pedagogical model has absolutely no influence and at the end the, the, the failure and the, the, uh, the, the slowly uh, going down of the, of the city uh, has nothing to do with, with education and the platoon system was not useful then what is the use of education or what is the use of uh, new, new, new models that at the end mm. they don't change anything because at mm. the end the city moves in a completely different way. It's, mm. a bit, uh, yeah. in a way. it's a bit a sad story, I think. With the, It is. Uh, so yeah. this, this, was this my... is exactly the... Okay, thank you for bo both questions and uh, both questions I am uh, very much aware of um, that it's... I. I was occupied with, with, with both questions. The first um, question when I was at Ishe in Chicago, uh, knowing that Gary was very nearby, I hoped that I had opportunity to visit Gary, but I didn't have um, the opportunity to stay longer in Chicago. And at that conference, I think I was involved in, it was crazy, I, I don't do that anymore, in, in four different um, sessions and workshops and, and panels, etc. And it was such a tight schedule that I simply didn't have time. I discussed it with uh, Lynn Fendler, who was also living in, uh, back then, uh, still living near uh, Chicago. And she also discussed, asked me, why don't you go there? But it was not that that easy. Actually, to be honest, and 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 this is uh, when I when I refer to to contacting colleagues at, at the University of Kerry, uh, I'm a bit afraid about doing that. And it's simply because of the outsider's perspective. I am a blank, uh, blank, blank, white, um, <laughs> white um, European man, and out, really an outsider. And we, ca we, we should not underestimate the race issue within this context. Yeah? Um, and when they do similar things, it's not, I, well, when I refer to community engagement, what they do is uh, fitting with us in, in, a, in an Anglo-Saxon um, social work context, which is different from my approach to it, but I don't want to go deeper into that. So there are some, some, so some issues, but I, but I will do it. I, I, I have to contact them. I would like to share my ideas. And that's actually behind this sentence at the very end of my presentation, we will see what comes out of it. When they think, oh, this is an interesting guy, um, they, 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 they offer this opportunity to, to visit Gary, I will definitely do that. Um, and then I will see. Um, but, but at some point, look, I collected, I, I've, I've, I've read more, hundred, no, literally hundreds of books, articles, texts, whatever. I consumed so much material on this. And this is actually the reason why I started with the platoon school. And now I come to your second question with the platoon system and that this carried me away from it. And I actually started a journey through articles. And this is referring, uh, this is related to what I call the ecological 
approach because it's starting somewhere with education it le it, it brought me to uh, other domains of life with uh, economy geography uh, urban planning etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's trying to see the threats or the interconnections between education and other domains of life which is so complex which is uh, which holds so many layers that i simply because this is at until now a, a very personal project of mine uh, you need time to do this and to return in a sufficient way to the starting point and to education uh, and to the core of my expertise and my business so i'm very much aware of that comment uh, it always occupies me when i start to to, to talk about gary but um, be aware and believe me, I will return to the core, uh, which is education in my regard, and uh, but also try to 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 put it in the bigger picture, as I also explained somewhere uh, in my presentation. Thank you. Uh, there was still a question or more questions. I don't know from Christoph. Sorry, Christoph, that I didn't uh, see your uh, hand raising. You have the floor. Thanks a lot. Thanks as well for the great um, talk. And uh, to be honest, um, I'm in the same field, but it's not historical education. It's design. It's information science. And the question, how do you design large digital or other systems? And so there is really the, the topic of different stakeholders, as Maria as well um, said before, and the space of imagine, imagination, because without that, we cannot find a space of design and, and, and a, a space of solutions. And I like really the, the topic of the wicked problem. It's really an old one and it comes from design methods movement in the 70s. And one big information scientist brought this up, Horst Rittel is from Germany. And he brought together with a designer from the US this kind of topic and it offers a lot. It offers really the chance to bring people into processes and bring their, 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 their minds and ideas into that. And so probably um, my question would be, so how do you see the, the difference between a designer and an education historian? Or is it the same? Where's the difference? Where's the common space probably? Well, thank you for, for your question. It's, it's good to, to know your background. Um, it's, um, it's, it's actually when I, when I defined social imagineering, um, I used a book from this um, um, designing context. It was um, edited by Dian Nees. Don't know whether you, you heard of her, but it's it's from the design context. And um, well, I have a very open view and a very broad um, uh, approach to this, uh, where I'm, I'm not concerned about um, is this is this history of education? Uh, when 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 I'm interested in it, I, I will start to read it and try to see connections. And this uh, designing approach, which which is um, when when I can stretch it a, a bit, talking about design, I'm also very much uh, interested in, in in of course the museum context and. Uh, curating and um, the, the, the artistic point of view, et cetera. So, so there's, there's much more involved in, in this and, and see um, how you can present um, outcome of, 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 of your research. Um, in, a, in a way to return to your question, I, I, um, I, I would say I've, don't, don't uh, start of, of trying to put yourself in in um, straight jacket uh, of your discipline and um, that's at least what I would not do in a, in a, in a particular way as soon as I um, enter this field of the design um, I'm I have to say I'm not so much into the the, the, the digitization part of this uh, um, but but at least some theoretical considerations that are at the basis of it I think uh, they are very interesting um, but as, as as soon as you start to enter this uh, other domains then then um, I consider it being part of my identity as an historian of it uh, of education and I think this is very important to open up possibilities also for interdisciplinary research. 
um, and I'm always very open to 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 uh, others than historians of education from other fields to cooperate when there is some joint interest. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's uh, yep. now Indeed. thank you all to give the floor to Michael Geis. He is from the professor at the Pedagogische Hochschule in Zurich in Switzerland, of course, and uh, he is leading there the center for education and digital change. Mikael, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mark, for introducing me. Thanks, Iveta, for inviting me. As the others said already, it's such a pity that we cannot meet in person. Finally, Iveta, we have met so often now on Zoom and would have loved to, to be shown around in the city of, of Riga today. Um, I'm trained as a historian of education. Um, as you would see today in my presentation, I'm also heavily interested in the history of economic development, in the history of technology, but I'm not, not an expert in, in public history or museology. And I think this is also the idea of this, this slot with Angelo and, and Jeroen um, that, we, that we talk as historians of education and childhood. I think there are anyway some some links to the other presentations. Um, while Jeroen showed how artists saw children, like seeing children through the artist's eyes, today in my talk I would like to talk about um, how advertisers saw children. So maybe there's a continuity in, in this story, I'm not sure. Um, short overview about my presentation today. I, I would like first to say a few words about um, the context of, of, of this research. Um, it's, it's placed within a, a larger environment, a research project, um, which is called Education, the European Digital Agenda. And I will, will tell you what, what this is about and how my my, my, the findings I present to you today relate to that. Um, then I would like to give some historical context about what I'm presenting you today. Um, and this is how computers entered the classroom in, in Switzerland. Um, then I turn to, to the main part of my presentation, uh, advertising educational tools from a historical perspective. And then I would give you a brief summary in the end. This project, Education in the European Digital Agenda, is um, a comparative one. Um, it, it compares developments in Switzerland, Germany, and Sweden. And in Germany, of course, you have um, East and West in the, in between 1970 and 2000. It's funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Um, and we start to two years ago, and it will be another two years that we are doing this research. Um, if you want to know more about the, the research team and, and what we are exactly doing there, you can visit our website, digitalagenda.ch. This project is heavily informed by two um, books. When I, when I wrote the application, um, I was uh, reading Larry Cuban's book that was published 20 years ago on computers in the classroom. This is an still, I think, an exciting historical case study on how computers have been implemented in the Silicon Valley and on all levels. And Cuban is studying the different actor groups um, that join forces to bring more computers into schools, to bring more computer science education into schools. Um, our research project somehow started um, with the findings of, of Cuban, but also tries to, to give a little bit like a more nu nuanced picture uh, and, and, and to focus here not on the American developments, but on the, the European ones. The second book was published while we were already starting our research. It's uh, Joy Lisi Rankin's People's History of Computing in the United States. From the title, you cannot see that this is, uh, I would say, uh, a study in the history of education because she is heavily interested in how computers have been used 
um, within uh, public schools. And um, she does very, very nice and detailed reconstructions of um, the developments before the, the microcomputer, the personal computer has been, has been implemented, um, how teachers and educators became active in the field of computer education, using computers, writing programs, and so on. This is a, a really a great uh, regional study of the implementation of computers in the education system. So those are, this is like the, the starting point of, of our project. Um, and what we now do is um, focusing especially on um, the question of how politics reacted to the digital transformation of the society. So this comparative um, part of the, 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 the project is on how in Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, East and West, politicians, administrators reacted to digital change by educational means. So what I present today is more like a side project to that. So I will not talk about politics, but about something we always stumble across while doing our research, because there's so much advertisement in the teacher's press and the education and media that is worth being studied as, as a phenomenon of its own. So to give you some context on, on the developments that, that we are studying. Um, what you can see, at least in Switzerland, is how closely um, the developments are linked uh, to um, the different steps in hardware development. So when you want to find out how educators, teachers, politicians, and so on became active in the field of, of computer, science education, this is really, really closely linked to hardware development. It makes a huge difference if you talk about mainframe computers and terminals, about so-called mini computers, which are quite still large in the 1970s, and then the, the personal computer. And this, each of those steps changes like the whole picture of what is going on and what is imagined, what is really done and so on. You can see very early endeavors for computer science education in, for example, commercial training, um, because when electronic data processing had been invented, um, the, the office workers had to be retrained. Uh, this was, was important to, 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 to still be efficient in the companies. You can see uh, early endeavors in industry, of course, when you look at CNC machines, computer system design, and so on. You can see how in state bureaucracy and university training, um, the, the, the different actors started early of training and retraining staff to, to work with those mainframe computers. But this is like not, not, a, not a larger development that, that uh, touches upon all different parts of the society. But you can find programming courses in higher secondary schools already in the late 1960s, and then almost all in, in cities, university cities like, like Zurich or Geneva, because there it was easy to, to, to connect um, your terminal through a telephone line to the mainframe computer of the university. More coherent pilot programs are issued then in the late 1970s. Um, you find central monitoring and regional programs or even national initiatives for all levels of the education system then in the 1980s. So in the first half of the 1980s in all cantons of Zurich, it's 26 cantons that, that we have there, um, like all the administrators start their own programs for implementing computer science education, even at elementary schools and even when there are no computers available yet. So, but everyone seems to think that this is somehow important. Quite special is it that in Switzerland, you have a highly decentralized system. So you have no national school law. You have 26 school laws till today. So there is no national authority in charge. 
And this also has a great effect on how computers are implemented, how computer science education is implemented in public schools. It takes quite a while to the early 1990s till you have a national ICT unit, which, for example, um, does all the negotiations with Microsoft about uh, school licenses for software and so on. So some, some numbers, um, there's not, not, of course, numbers available for, for the whole period, also due to the highly decentralized st structure. But here you can see at least uh, that, that something is happening uh, between or in the 1980s already. So you have like quadrupled numbers between 1985 and, and 1990s when it comes to school computers, also the ratio per school changes. A lot, and this is uh, true not only for vocational schools, but also for the higher secondary schools and the upper elementary schools. You always have this uh, quadrupled numbers here. This is from a study in, in 1990. What is quite special, also compared to what, for example, is going on in Sweden and other countries, is that you have. Um, a very mixed picture of what is exactly introduced when it comes to the companies that um, are able to sell their computers. You don't have only two competitors and you have like large uh, regional differences um, on what computers are exactly used. Of course, here in, in the mid 1980s, IBM is still really, really important. But there are also other competitors that you don't even know anymore today. Like if you look at the DAC, this is the Digital Equipment Corporation. This was one of the main competitors. No, no one knows them anymore. They don't exist anymore. You have still Olivetti, a typewriter manufacturer, um, like, like, like IBM ones. Um, also quite important, like uh, because the closeness of the Italian border and so on. But you also have others, smaller um, or even regional producers. And we think this is also due to the highly decentralized structure. So you, you, you cannot, like in, in the Netherlands, Bill Gates went to the educational minister and tried to, try to, to sell um, the machines in, in, in Switzerland. There was no one available that you, that you could uh, approach to, 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 to make a, a national contract or something. So what, what is available for, for the state authorities is only soft governance instruments. What they did is monitoring and bringing people together, but they could not make any central decisions. And so it's quite fascinating how much is still going on there. Um, public education became a sales market for quite a great range of hardware and then later also software providers. You see a lot of enthusiasm as well as critique in the educational media. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's like, if, if you look into the daily press, you see a lot of enthusiasm. Sometimes people are worried about, okay, everyone will lose his job and so on. But like this, this coding euphoria is quite omnipresent also in the, already in the 1980s. So now, if you look at the critique, there it's quite interesting how children are depicted. This image here is from an article, it's not an advertisement, um, from 1986, which was published in a more left-wing alternative um, journal. And there, um, the, the editors are asking, will there be the next, the new educational crisis? And what you see, I will, will try to zoom a little bit, is a child sitting on a potty chair and you see like like on the top you see a computer that shows basic this is like the the programming language and um, that everyone was trained on and, and and on the on the lower m screen you see um like a, a video game so the idea behind this people kids are supposed to learn basic but of course what they want to do is playing video games, which was when you go into the archives and so on, this is not, uh, this is not like, this is something that you find. So it's uh, computer games have been an issue, have been played on the school computers and so on. This is of course something 
to teenagers do, but also teachers love to do. So, but here you still don't don't have the advertisements. This is like how how an illustration in in in, in the public discourse was uh, was 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 shaped. So, I come now to the part looking at more closely on how educational tools have been advertised in this context. Advertisements as an historical source are not so often used in the history of education. I think this is a more and more like a, a nerdy thing to be so interested in that. Like I like 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 your your crush on 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 American progressivism, maybe mine is on 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 advertisements here, I would say. Um, I have to, 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 to say here that I'm only looking on advertisements in the teacher's press. So it would be quite interesting to look also, this is a topic that Jeroen is also interested in, like, interested in I guess, in, in, in like parenting journals, for example, if, if there are difference, I haven't done that yet. Or if you look at children's magazines, for example, it would be interesting to have a look there, but this is like not, not, not what, what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm only focusing on, on the teacher press. Um, and my source corpus consists here of three journals. One is the main journal of the Swiss elementary school teachers in the French speaking and the German speaking parts. Um, uh, the Schweizerische Lehrerzeitung, the journal for the elementary school teachers. Um, the second one is the journal for the Swiss ICT teachers. It's called Interface. And the third one is the journal of Swiss teachers at higher secondary schools, which is gymnasium in, in, in German. So, and what you see here is, um, is, is one of the issues. This is also not an advertisement, but you can find many, many of those journals where uh, technology issues are covered. Technology and media is something so many of those issues of the teacher press in Switzerland is heavily interested in. And it's quite interesting that most of the advertisements that are found are also placed exactly in those journals. So I guess that the editors reached out to the companies, told them, we will have a special issue on education and media and technologies. Don't you want to place your advertisements here? So, um, because this cannot be a coincidence here. You find plenty of illustrated advertisements and many issues, but it, I would say there's not a huge difference between the different journals, so you don't have you, have, you find the same advertisements in, in the different journals. So they, they are not produced like for different levels of, of education. I start here not with computers, but with something in, in, in another technology I'm, 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 I'm heavily interested in as an historian, the, the language lab, um, in, in, because it's, it's a great, great example to show what, 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 what you can find in those advertisements. Um, but what you see often is great educational promises, which are often quite contradictory. So it's, it's often a combination of different educational promises, Jeroen would say ambitions maybe, um, that, that don't really uh, fit to each other. What you, of course, in the language lab advertisements always see is this combination of efficiency and absolute control. So you see here, this is an efficient way of language learning, but the teacher can look in each cabin and has the total control. And this is not, uh, still a rather nice image here. You see others where it really looks like someone controlling the classroom and, and pushing buttons and so on. But what you find at the same time is another educational promise, uh, which is individualized learning. There you often have these um, handwritten uh, style um, advertisement, like here, individualized language learning, it says in this advertisement and so on. So you have control, efficiency, individualization at the same time. Of course, it's always the teachers that is addressed here. Sometimes the school authorities, which have to pay for the devices, it's not the children or the parents that are addressed. And this doesn't totally change when it comes to advertising educational computers, like here in the 1976 advertisement, where you see the so-called classic computer by the Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, there you also have often those, um, the teachers are addressed, the school authorities, and you have this combination of total control 
efficiency as, as an aspiration. But I would say, and this is something that we might discuss today, is um, that the control narrative is losing importance in those advertisements compared to like the older educational technologies. And there's a large focus on collaboration, like on this image, on more egalitarian social relations, on creativity, and also on fun. The teacher is still addressed. It's here, the teacher, that his teaching should be more easygoing. But as someone, it says in this advertisement, that has to learn himself. It's the teacher that is helped by the computer. Always cooperation, individualized learning in all trades is emphasized. And this is the word play there on the top of this advertisement. The tech company is depicted as a role model and as an educational actor at the same time. The student is presented as a user with special needs and learning looks like an enhancing and it says in the text playful activity. But this activity should be at the same time even efficient, even if it's fun and individualized and so on. So now I come to my brief summary. I have the impression that the total control narrative is a vanishing paradigm in those computer adverts. Efficiency and individualized learning continue to be promised and learning should now be fun. This cannot be find, found in the, in the older advertisements I, I, on, on audio, visual, uh, the media and so on. The computer appears here as a universal machine with which everything seems to become possible. And the child, like the teachers, appear as a user with special needs. Something that is still open also to me is if those ads just reflect more general trends, cooperation, individualization, and so on, more egalitarian social relations and so on, or if it's the personal computer forcing teachers and schools into more radical forms of individualized learning, and that it's also not possible to, to show such a strong control narrative with the personal computer. So that this is what would be an odd combination. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think there is uh, time for question now uh, before coffee. I myself have some questions, but I would like to give the floor first to other people. Uh, Jeroen, yes, please. Thank you, uh, Michael, for this uh, very uh, creative uh, presentation. Um, one remark and one question. Remark is about uh, the advertising. Um, you were speaking about uh, in later advertising that they were much more promising. Um, well, I think that's, um, of course, true. But I think also that's part of a more general trend in advertising. When you are looking about 30 years ago, uh, most advertising was giving information and more and more for all sorts of products, beer, cars, etc. It's not with uh, about information on beer or mm. information on cars, but it's about an atmosphere and a, a lifestyle in which the car or the beer or whatever uh, is placed. So I think it's it's part of a general transformation trend in advertising. Um, as to the question you, you uh, showed us the. Um, advertising of the child with, with the text, um, um, the uh, Bildungskrise. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked myself, did you also find uh, an advertisement in the same time with such a computer and then a child crisis? 
Um, and secondly, was also was then not, not yet uh, the idea um, that uh, playing um, playing was a com computer game was all, also a way of uh, learning by playing, so that perhaps the computer could make the um, Bildungskrise uh, much um, less important. So um, is this the only way in the advertisement of that moment of connecting the child and uh, the introduction of the computer? Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, maybe I was not precise enough here. I, I, I don't think that um, advertisements became more promising. Yes, of course, it, it's only if you look at advertisement in the 19, I would say, 30s and 40s, there you only have lift lists with information. So you, you cannot make it, it's not really advertisements. It's more like uh, ordering lists. <laughs> I, I want this product and this one. Yeah, that's that's total, totally true. Um, and this crisis um, image, this was not an advertisement. This was like how the same discourse has been uh, depicted in, in a journal. And I, I never found- I saw that, yes. Yeah, and in the, in the adverts, the crisis narrative is, is, is not there. It's, it's always a, it, a way more optimistic way of and 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 uh, now yeah maybe it's 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 there but it's not on the on the surface so it's it's like already the response to maybe an uh, an alleged um, crisis and the computer game thing I'm I'm just writing an artic article about that and it's quite interesting how how educators were were first or quite for for quite a while not very fond of the idea of computer games in in schools like when they wrote about it because um, they thought that this was again something um it, more the the children at risk discourse the whole thing of okay this is a danger we need to be careful here can we maybe produce more uh, games that are more um more educational and so on um, and, and this changes not to the 1990s, I would say, um, that, that, that they, they, they became more open of using those games also for educational purposes. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think there is also a possibility to um, answer your question or more or less in the direction of a history of education argumentation. To my mind, uh, I think there is probably a swift from uh, the classical education, but not without losing uh, with, without losing the classical composition, or uh, but trying to integrate some elements of new education and progressive education, like softness, like playing, uh, learning is play, and, and and so on. But in your uh, image of the language learning lab, for instance, you see the composition of the classes, stereotypical, just what is the place in the lab, but in fact is the, the class, the teacher is before, and then you have the, the, the benches or uh, the desks of the, of the pupils in front. So that doesn't change. But what is tricky today, uh, there is due to uh, PISA and, and, and things like that uh, here in Flanders, there is a lot of discussion of lowering the level. The level is too low and we have to increase mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the scores of, of PISA again and so on. And this is all the, the, the people uh, that are blamed are the pedagogues because they have stick to uh, the, the, the child in the center, the soft pedagogy, emotions, and so on, and all these things playing and, and not learning enough. So a adagium of the new school was learning is playing and playing is learning and so on. That's the old adagium. That, that is now considered more or less by, by, by some opinion makers 
as a nonsense. Uh, we have to uh, go back to very classical instruction, discipline, order, and cognition, uh, learning, learning knowledge. Knowledge is important, it's the power knowledge society again, and so, and so on. Does that same trend reflect is if you analyze now the, 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 the advertising of the moment or at the moment? I, I don't know so much about advertising today, so I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I, but I would say um, the, those more progressive motives, yeah. they, they are not, not in the language lab adverts, but if you look no, at no, the, no, afterwards, I mean, at the computer advert, of course, yeah. they, are, they are all there. So, and, and this is they also, try to integrate, of course. But, and this is also Cuban's argument like when he looked at the Silicon Valley School, yeah, of course, he yeah. saw how the progressive educators. And those techies join forces, and and, and this ha happens also today. If you look at the ad tech industry, and and also some very progressively minded um, educators, they they want to bring in their ideas into those tools. So it's not, I, I don't know if it's a good idea, but but you can see that. Yeah, that's another thing. And this is more, I would say, even a counter movement to the whole PISA and 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 like teacher-centered approach. Which is interesting because it's both scary, I would say. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, what scares me most is that both have such ahistorical arguments by using history, and that's what, what I wanted to stress uh, this morning a, a bit. They are sweeping everything in the corner and they use and they pick up from uh, history what they can use in, 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 in the argumentation without contextualization. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is scaring, I think, for a historian. Anyhow, uh, I have to stop because it's time for coffee. Iveta, when should we be back? Uh, we should be uh, back at uh, four o'clock Regas uh, time. We uh, continue uh, the uh, schedule and we have to be prepared for last session for, uh, for today. Yeah, so uh, see you in 20 minutes approximately. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all at our closing session of the day. My name is Arvid Stravnic, and I am one of the organizers of this conference, and I'm glad to chair the last, but I'm sure it's not the least, session of uh, the first conference day. Uh, Ines will help me with all the technical issues and all the things relating questions. Um, and in the closing session of this day, we cover three very different, but at the same time, very interesting and even intriguing topics. Um, let's start from the beginning. And our first presenter is Professor Dorena Caroli from Italy. She represents University of Bologna and her presentation is the diary of a Soviet pupil, Kosya Ratzel, as a source of the new Soviet school of 1920s. Um, please, the screen is yours, Dorena. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And thank you to Iveta for the organization of this conference. And I am very happy to be with you. And um, I have chosen for uh, this conference uh, to speak about the diary of um, a Soviet pupil, Kostya Ryaps. Is, it is a, mm, a quite known diary, uh, but not enough investigated. I'll present um, a work in progress, 
more than uh, uh, some deep results. And um, I'll try to, uh, to uh, approach uh, this diary uh, from a different point of view. And the most important is that uh, this diary is uh, a mirror of the reform of the Soviet school after the Bolshevik revolution of 1917. Um, and, I'll try to understand the literary model of this diary um, and, um, and the most diffuse diary at the time, because this, uh, this diary um, has had uh, very interesting models. And um, the most important aspect is uh, the, um, uh, the uh, experimental phase of the Soviet school reform mirrored in these pages, in the page uh, of this uh, adolescent uh, during uh, 23 and 24. And uh, who, is, who is the author of this book? Uh, uh, the author is a Soviet author, Nikolai Ognev, is a pseudonym uh, from um, Mikhail Rosanov. He had a brother, also a children writer. It's because maybe he chose a, a pseudonym. And um, he was also writer for children theater. And he was educator in Moscow uh, in a children educational community. Uh, during a particular period after the revolution, when uh, the problem of abandoned children uh, was very uh, heavy. The diary has been written in, 20, uh, in 1926. The style is very uh, direct with a lot of dialogues, uh, maybe because his author uh, was very near to the constructivist and the construct constructivist at the time uh, also from the aesthetical point of view, wanted to transmit the sense uh, of the life with, with its communist changes. That is, we, we, we will speak about the communist changes inside the school. Um, the diary was published in Riga. Um, his first edition was in Riga. Uh, by the publisher Grama Tudragaus uh, in the Petri Tsarkovskaya Plosha. Uh, it's written on the, on the book. We have a, an image, maybe I have found, um, uh, Iveta will, will uh, confirm us if it's the right place where this book was um, uh, printed. And it was translated into English as the diary of a communist schoolboy in 1928, there are some uh, very brilliant um, uh, article contribution by a, Soviet, a Russian specialist, Svetlana Maslinskaya, who uh, has studied from the literary point of view. I would like to place uh, my text more in the context of the uh, educational reform. The main hero um, is Kostya, Konstantin, a second grade pupil aged 15. Uh, we have two models of this diary as a literary genre. We have uh, one model from a bad boy diary uh, about uh, the child adolescent behavior toward the peer and adult world. That is, um, I am trying to investigate uh, and to analyze the text from uh, um, uh, the, the point, also from the point of view of the um, literary style and from the literary genre, but um, most of all, from the point of, of view of the school representation. 
because um, uh, uh, we can observe the school life from the 15th September 1923 until the 1st September of the following year. The first model is a bad boy diary translated into Russian uh, at the end of the century and uh, by Meta Victor, uh, Meta Fuller Victor. And we have also another um, uh, diary very similar in Italian, for example, uh, Il Diario di Giamburrasca, who is uh, a case of, of um, literary transfer into Italy by Luigi Bertelli. But we have uh, also another case of educational transfer of, um, of the Diary Health book for boys from Italy. And they have investigated in the last year, uh, several years of this case, uh, because um, the Italian writer Edmondo de Amicis has been translated into Russia from uh, 1892. And um, he said uh, this book had uh, 17 translations before the Bolshevik Revolution. And one of the most important has been done by Sister Lenin, uh, Lenin's sister. And Lenin also um, uh, liked a lot this book for boys. Uh, the two diar diary are very different because the first one is more a diary of a rascal, of a boy uh, rebelling against adult authority, for example. The second one is uh, a diary representing a new school. And for Russia at the time, um, the model uh, presented by the Amicis uh, based on solidarity between uh, social classes was the most important model for the new Russian school. Mm, uh, there are a lot of cases uh, of uh, very quickly, I would like to, to, um, to say uh, a lot of um, educational transfer from Italy to Russia, also concerning adult education. You maybe know better the film, uh, The Lady and the Ule Uligan uh, with Mayakovsky as main hero. Another very famous case is the uh, Ivan's childhood, um, uh, the son of the regiment from the Amicis, another case of educational uh, um, transfer of patriotic education. And it's at the basis of the film also Ivanovo Dietstvo, Ivan's childhood. And um, this transfer, I, I will explain better why it is so important also for the reception uh, of the uh, reform mirrored in Kostya Rapsev diary. As you know, uh, the Bolshevik revolution promised um, education, uh, um, the fight against illiteracy, ideological education that is a better society. And we can see also some poster of the time that a, um, an, illiterate, uh, an illiterate person is like a blind or another poster um, showing very, very uh, uh, through the propaganda that um, it's important to, um, uh, to have knowledge for the production. And for the production, we need uh, even, <laughs> uh, always more, more knowledge. And so school, uh, as uh, they are in the other um, uh, totalitarian uh, societies, was an important instrument of um, educating and of uh, um, uh, for the ideology. But how was this Soviet reform conceived? Uh, the Soviet reform uh, was not suddenly Marxist. Uh, there are a lot of books and very brilliant uh, from Fritz Fitzpatrick to Larry Holmes and uh, 
um, Thomas Having, a lot of brilliant historians are at the basis of, of a, a lot of my research uh, because uh, we, we have to understand that the uh, Soviet school wa was not suddenly Marxist, but it was um, uh, the re result of different debates and phases. After the revolution, uh, the main Soviet debate inside the Commissariat of Enlightenment, that is the, uh, the Commissariat charged of Enlightenment, and NKP means Narkompros, that is a, a, um, um, a acronym meaning Commissariat of Enlightening, um, had uh, to was faced to two school to two school of thought in educational policy uh, inside the Soviet uh, governmental institution charged of education. The one centered in Petrograd two schools of thought, two tendons, I would uh, say. Um, I, I hope to make me understandable. Um, uh, the one centered in, in Petrograd and the other in Moscow. Both were progressive in the sense of advocating activity um, method uh, of teaching, pupil participation, the self-government, somehow pravlenie, informal relation between pupil and teachers, a new curriculum, um, uh, uh, Marxist ideology, um, uh, and basing educational system on the polytechnical school. But uh, um, the group of Moscow um, put main emphasis on school commune, uh, which was to form the, uh, the, the, ch the children total environment through the whole week and the whole year. They found the Moscovite groups that polytechnic skills should be taught not in a school workshop, but by life itself. That is through the practical experience organizing and maintaining the school commune. Like the later famous Ukrainian educational Makarenko, uh, um, they were um, close to the family and only secondarily interested in leaving the child to development according to his individual bent. They accused reciprocally of Tolstoyism, but in any case, this, that is the Muscovit and the Petrograds, but in any case, they came uh, to a document about the declaration um, about the unified labor school. Uh, but why did they accuse reciprocally of Tolstoyism? Because before the revolution, I hope that the, um, the, the page is visible, uh, in the context of the free education movement, uh, strictly tied, to the school of Jasnaya Polyana, founded by Tolstoy, uh, uh, John Dewey was translated. That is, John Dewey was translated directly by the Tolstoyan. And also the school and society was translated by a Tolstoyan publisher interested in the role of labor activity in the Tsarist school reform already before the revolution. A group of Russian educators were inspired by Dewey, new philosophy of education, his progressive model of school, and ideas of organizing children activities in a laboratory. In the cover image of Schola i Obstva, that is school and society, translated in by a publisher, the publisher was Postriednik, and the publisher was uh, founded by Tolstoy at the end of the century, because Tolstoy wanted to fight against uh, illiteracy and uh, build a new school. The Tolstoyan translated also uh, De Amici's diary, hearth, book for boys. 
And it's because I can um, see a relation between all these elements. I hope enough in, in enough clear way, but I can um, repeat that is um, Tolstoyan um, translated Dewey, but also the Italian um, diary uh, that could be a model for our Kostya Rapsiev diary. And um, uh, they translated uh, Dewey, and you, it's well known that Dewey had a deep influence on Soviet school, um, on the post-revolutionary Soviet school. But we can see in the image the spin to the loom, as in Dewey's uh, Chicago laboratory. Um, uh, and um, um, the final declaration of the Unified Labor School in 1918 was the result of the two tendencies from Petrograd and from uh, uh, Moscow. Uh, what, what is important that labor meant activity in a school workshop, school garden plot, um, and as a mean of becoming acquainted with conventional technology uh, or technique of agricultural and industrial production. For elementary grades, the declaration proclaimed um, a particular program separate um, and um, um, uh, and um, um, I can summarize this. Um, uh, the, the reform wanted to abolish uh, boundaries separating subjects. And um, um, the school uh, should be conceived for a classless society promoting social mobility and not being elitarian as it was the case in the fascist school. That is, the school should be for uh, all the children uh, without social distinction. And uh, uh, for this reason, the school should be free. Uh, boys and girls uh, should learn together. The school should be based on work as Dewey uh, suggested, but because also Marxist ideology um, uh, um, uh, suggested this uh, from Engels and Marx, of course. And um, uh, the United, Unified Labor School should be split into, into uh, grades uh, for children age eight, um, 17, uh, should be of nine years, the first grade of five years and the second of four years. But um, the situation was, was very particular for Russia at the time. You know that in, in 1921, there was a terrible famine in the Volga region. And it's because uh, school um, attendance was reduced to seven years, four plus three. Um, and only later, uh, nine years school was introduced, and the 10 years school was introduced only in the, at the end of the uh, 50s. So you can understand that the development of the school is the same in all Europe. Also in the fascist Italy, we have um, uh, this grade and really a um, uh, very low um, uh, uh, percentage of attendance. And um, at uh, 12, 14 years after the first grade, there was uh, the school for professional training in industry or agriculture. For that time, it was uh, also an utopia to have a, a school for all the children, an utopia that should build a new man, but um, uh, we'll see that uh, the Soviet reform uh, introduced uh, activism, that is, introduced an activist, um, activities based on a new curricula because it should develop lab labor, labor inside the school. 
And in order to develop labor in such a school, we can observe the reception of the activity method the methodology connected with Dewey, in particular, the complex method or the project method by Dewey's disciple, William Kilpatrick, um, also translated by Tolstoyans, and the progressive method or Darton plan by Ellen Parkhurst, and uh, from the name of um, um, this educational. The result was that according to the Dal Dalton plan, pupils should learn through project. And the project method uh, was introduced not everywhere, but um, uh, according to this project, uh, in the Soviet reform from 21-22, uh, uh, there should be only three, uh, three subjects, that is la labor, nature and society. Uh, um, so uh, the Bolshevik uh, strived at introducing a new school based on American um, didactics. didactics. And uh, in the secondary grade, these methods was, uh, were less diffused um, because the declaration allowed lang language science traditional subject, I would say. But uh, in our diary, we will see the experimentation of this, uh, of this methodology. It's a very difficult topic to connect the context with the text. But I hope to um, I hope to, to give some elements for a better comprehension. Uh, through this project method and reform, uh, the pupil should be liberated from teacher authoritarianism um, of the uh, of the past uh, and freed from adult control and pupil. Are supposed were supposed to uh, react more responsibly, um, but we see also uh, through this uh, reform that again some elements of the school of Jasna Apoliana of Tolstoy to be introduced. That is abolition of examination, abolition of homework, abolition of punishment. All this came from the school of Tolstoy. And it because I, I have um, said there were um, uh, two groups uh, from Pre Petrograd and, Mo and Moscow. And it was very difficult to understand uh, the differences because they accused themselves uh, reciprocally of Tolstoyism. But again, the school of Yastra and Poliana was at the basis of this reform, who introduced also the Dalton plan. Uh, the introduction of the complex method uh, was the first attempt to change the learning process. Traditional subjects were abolished and complex topics and explanatory um, uh, um, were introduced instead. Topics were devoted to the, the new Soviet reality. Uh, in, instead of uh, traditional um, topics, there were uh, uh, subjects, there were topics as uh, winter work in the village, uh, Soviet Union and the world, and not local project, um, not only local project um, um, developed uh, from an interdisciplinary way, but based on the economic dimension. Uh, each teacher opened the topic from the a point of view of his subject. We have seen um, labor, nature, or work. Uh, only three topics, and from these three topics, each, each teacher could build an in interdisciplinary lessons. Of course, in practice, teaching was chaotic. Neither the pupils nor the, the teacher uh, uh, knew what to do with the new curriculum. Here we have some images. Maybe the teacher is explaining what to do. Few books and books are also disappearing. 
And um, I'll go maybe uh, um, quickly to, to uh, Kostya Ryapsev diary. Mm, and I can see, I can uh, already uh, say that the Dalton plan was not successful in the Soviet school and uh, was soon abandoned at the end of the 20s. Kostya Rapsev is the mirror of his of this failure. He seems more a rascal, uh, rebelling against the Dalton plan than a good pioneer accepting the new Soviet va values. But at the end, he becomes a good pioneer, accepting all the um, all all the um, uh, new um, aspect of the Soviet school. The diary that is the text that I'll try to in this investigate uh, begins on the 15th of September in 1923. Uh, and uh, he complains, Kostka uh, complains that the school had, had not yet, um, uh, did, hasn't begun yet, because normally in, in um, Soviet Union, the, the school, uh, also in Russia today, uh, begins uh, on the 1st of September. And he begins uh, with uh, some uh, rebelling against the adult world because he wants to change his name from Konstantin. Uh, to Vladelin, to, uh, that is to Vladimir Lenin. Um, uh, he has no problem with his ego, uh, that is, he chooses the name of the leader of the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, finally, the school opened on the, on the 20th of September. But what he's going to say about the, all the new reform, about the Dalton plan? The Dalton plan on the 17th of September, he says, is, is being introduced at our school. It's a system under which the, this worker that is the teacher. It's a contraction of the Russian um, school uh, worker. And uh, uh, it's because all the book is uh, um, in all the books there are plenty of uh, um, of slang because it's also a way of the pupil to to imitate or to or to to present some humoristic uh, in some humoristic style the the changes of the school. So the school workers do nothing and the pupil have to find everything out from themselves. At least that's what it looks like to me. There will be no more classes and the pupils will merely be given tasks, that is um, topics to solve. This will be handed out a month in advance and may be prepared either at home or in school. On when our task is finished, you get examined at the lab, at the laboratory. Uh, there will be labs instead of classrooms, and in each there will be a, special, um, a specialist of, of one topic, nature, labor, and work. In that particular subject, Al Fish, the contraction of the name of the teacher, uh, for instance, will be hanging around the mat, mathematic mm, laboratory. Nick Petoj, the sociology laboratory, that is uh, working on um, labor uh, from the Marxist point of view, and so on. They will be uh, the spiders and will be the flies. And um, uh, there are a lot of um, topics uh, to be investigated in th this diary, of course. But I have chosen for you the, um, some aspect, the Dalton plan, the school slang, um, a, a lot of words sound strange to an English reader. Poo Council is the council of pupils because everything is based on um, uh, um, auto um, self administration of the pupils of the teacher that is the um, the laboratory the lab laboratory of training um, for becoming a Soviet citizen. The school workers and the, that is the teacher 
are also called scrub. Uh, we, we think it's a sort of, uh, of um, uh, animal and it's a, the uh, contraction of Skolni Rabotnik, that is a school uh, worker. Um, also, the name of the boys are abbre abbreviated Elena Nikitichna Kaurova and Ilkilta, uh, for example, Almak Fish, and so on. In the contraction of words and the wide use of jargon illustrate the new Russian tendency towards Americanized didactics. But we have also some more, um, uh, some more words about the Dalton plan. All the desks have been crammed into the room, which will be the lecture hall. Instead of the desk, desk will have long benches and table all together, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Crowley, five minutes. And, um, Five minutes. Maybe. So, uh, yes, and in all this um, um, abstract that I have chosen for you, you can see uh, both a critic, but also some humoristic and satirical aspects toward the new, uh, the new methodology that also teacher couldn't really um, realize very well. And um, the Dalton plan think is a washout. No one can understand a thing, even the school teacher, for example. And uh, the boys say that this plan was invented by, by some Lord Dalton or a bourgeois stock. Um, but now I wonder what the day will what the day will we need this bourgeois plan for? Because uh, for children, of course, it was very difficult and adolescent to work with this. Uh, with this, and um, and I can um, go ahead a little bit um, because uh, they complained that there were, were no books, for example, and also that they were submitted to the pedological um, specialists at the school. And the, and the pedologists wrote a characteristic of e each child. And our Kostya, poor Kostya, co is complaining because he says um, he, he read the characterization and he can read general development decidedly backward for his age. Studies with great difficulty, self-confidence colossal. We know his name was Vlen Lad, that is Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, it's because takes an exceptionally keen and enthusiastic participation to social work, but loses his interests rapidly. And then um, all, all his character is described by this uh, uh, specialist of um, um, psychology um, in the school. And uh, he says that this uh, uh, way is also a, an invention by Stanley Hall, a typical Stanley Hall adolescent. And he say, who is this Stanley Hall? Probably another bourgeois like Dalton. The matter is that I study with difficulty it's because of Dalton. And um, um, in conclusion, I can say that the analysis of a diary, even written by an adult who presents a social construction shaping a narrative that demands a deeper analysis, reflect, nevertheless reflects the educational culture of the school. The experimentation phase of the social uh, Soviet reform that failed at the end of the, at the 20s. The commissariat of enlightenment oriented itself towards a more traditional school later, the Stalinist school. There are other important aspects that can be analyzed further in the research, the school language, gender identity and conflicts, generational conflicts and bullism that were viewed as hooliganism. For example, um, uh, a school where and teachers were accused of this hooliganism, uh, hooli, uh, hooligan phenomenon 
that were a symbol of political disorder inside the school. And it was because co-education was abolished later. Uh, we can see in the diary other aspects, and I am, I, I, am, I am concluding, social discrimination between proletarian pupils and non-proletarian pupils. Um, and that um, later characterized the system, the role of the pedologist at the school, but um, we can see the way in which this should be a model for all the adolescents because Kostya became a good pioneer at the time, a model for the other children. And many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Crowley. Thank you very much for an insight in this very complicated topic, uh, an insight in this topic called uh, the organization of Soviet school system. And uh, thank you for this um, uh, wonderful example. Uh, do you have any questions, comments? Yes, Professor Maria, please. Uh, yes, uh, very short because uh, we are a bit late with time. But uh, yes, the, this Costa Diary is really uh, a, a very typical example of uh, educational transfer transfer all over all over Europe because it was translated to Dutch, to English, to Spanish, to German. It was translated to all the languages. I think that this is a work that the um, historians of education we should do to study uh, how this book was going everywhere and how it was uh, uh, received and adopted in national context. Because, for example, uh, well, at a certain moment it appears that the word task and clearly the word task is the word assignment that was used by Helen Parkhurst in the, in the Dalton plan. On the other side, uh, well, it's very much also in the pedagogical context of the uh, possible conflicts between the Dalton plan that was individualized, it was an individualized model that at this moment it was um, triumphing in, in England and in the Anglo-Saxon countries and the project method that normally is considered that comes from Dewey uh, uh, via Kilpatrick, but really Dewey even was not in favor of the project method, but that it was like the other pedagogical model. And okay, this drives together so many uh, topics that have to do with the pedagogy to the education, uh, the, tra the transfer, the pedagogical transfer of the ideas, that I think that, um, okay, it's a topic for a seminar or a conference alone in itself. Thank you, thank you. I have, uh, uh, I have noted all uh, <laughs> the, um, your suggestions. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, um, it would need a deeper, deeper research and an, an, uh, a deeper work, of course. You, you cannot do it completely alone. You cannot see all the translations. It should be nice to have a kind of seminar where everybody oh, nice. comes with a translation to, because you can know the translation to that, to Spanish, to German, but uh -huh. it would be nice to bring all these people together and to see how it was translated to every in every country and how it was received in every country, because there are many national differences with this book, with the Costia Diary. Uh, it's, uh, it's, very, can... very, it's very, very interesting topic of, uh, of study, very, very interesting. Uh, Three years ago, I was giving a lecture in Hungary uh, with uh, Professor Kathleen Kerry in the, in the conference of the pedagogues, and they were completely interested because also it was translated to Hungarian, and it was a very, very reference book, the Diary of Post. Even it was translated another time in the 60s, in 1970. So it's such a huge topic of, of uh, study that... Uh, you should organize in a small conference for, for putting together different researches because there are many people interested in this topic. Okay, thank, thank you, you Maria, for, Sorry, thank you, Maria, for your command, comment. Uh, yes, Professor Caroli, following good academic traditions, opened up a number of uh, uh, questions for wider discussion. 
for even uh, I think uh, Gerald has uh, yeah so we have technical problems with uh, Inga's uh, presentation yeah therefore Gerald you have a question yes I uh, I understood from uh, you yeah uh, uh, please and we will try to solve uh, problems with uh, with uh, uh, Inga's Sarma uh, presentation if not Joanna you can uh, we will switch to your presentation. Well, a very brief question about a rich uh, presentation based on a rich source. And the author is dying in 1938. So my, my idea was, was he a victim of Stalin? Um, he, he died of, um, from an illness, not because of purges. It was not repressed. Yes, I thought the same when I have seen 38, because it's the year of the great purges, uh, repression, but uh, uh, he had uh, health problems. So his, his past in terms of uh, re, uh, progressive education was not a problem for him in that, that time. That's the conclusion then. Um, uh, no, no, because it was a, a, a decision that to, to abandon progressive education of the Commissariat of Enlightenment. And Luna Charsky uh, was, um, uh, um, uh, was replaced by, by Bubnov, that is at the, uh, at the um, uh, uh, institutional level, there was a deep change also in, edu in educational politics. And uh, the Stalin school begins at the beginning of the 30s. And Stalin wants the Communist Party publish different um, uh, decree about uh, the introduction of the uh, traditional subject. And I think that also Iveta can confirm that the, the process was um, uh, at the beginning of the 30, 31, 32, 33. And, uh, and then we had a more traditional school. Um, uh, and uh, base, uh, because Stalin complained that he wanted a good school for building uh, better specialists for industrialization. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you also. Uh, so we will try uh, Inga's presentation uh, now and hope that everything will go well. Uh, please, Inga. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> I am English Sarma. But unfortunately, we can't see your presentation. Can you share the screen with us? At, at, at the bottom of, uh, of the page, you can see a green button, share screen. You have to push it and... Uh... Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, I am Inga Sarma from Yurmal City Museum. I am historian. And my report is a reflection of the Yurmal City Museum exhibition, a Child in a Resort, opened some years ago. Excuse me, Inga, uh, we can't see your presentation. Do you have presentation? Yeah, but like it's a good group. Mm -hmm. Which... You can you can uh, okay you can share screen with us and then we can see your presentation. Uh, the resort uh, were of course invented by adults. It happened in the middle of the 18th century in England. And the first seaside resort is uh, in Scarborough, Margate, and Brighton, where adults afflicted with various diseases and ailments came during the winter to go into the cold waters and fight their illnesses. So uh, there were no children in the resorts during this time. That does not mean that children did not get sick. In fact, they became uh, ill and mess. This meant uh, that. Uh, 
become very similar to what we know them today. Her children more and more often. Uh, so truthfully, they were almost impossible to notice. With the arrival of 20th century, their knowledge or, of moral and spiritual values to be strengthened. In the middle of 20th century, adults and children began to spend much more time together and much more attention was paid to children's health and disease prevention. And it became uh, common to spend the holidays of the parents together with each other, preferably at the resort. The first resorts were intended for wealthy people, for those who had the time and privilege to think about their health and rest, travel expenses, rent, medical services and food at the spa were not cheap pleasures. However, once the public had come to know children's health concerns, children could be seen in all seaside resorts under the supervision of nannies and governesses. In a 1904 review of the Mayor Resort, the popular doctor at the resort, Zhukovsky, wrote, Among my patients in my five years of experience in Yurmala, I have met many who leave their children in Majorenhof without a second thought in the care of German, French and English governesses. When for various reasons all family members, both adult and children, are obliged to receive treatment in various Russian and foreign resorts. Yurmal was especially recommended for children suffering from tuberculosis. It was believed that the gentle air of Gulf of Riga, the pine forests and the abundance of sunlight reflected by the sea and white sand all played a part uh, in the positive effect on recovery. Children went for walks in, with their parents, spent a lot of time in the summer gardens and verandas. The younger children went swimming with their mothers during women's swimming hours using the women's bathing jetties, while boys went they, uh, when they with their fathers. Uh, this meant that family members spent much of their time in the resort apart from one another. From the 19th century until the mid-1920s, there were separate bathing hours for women and men in Yurmala. Yurmala was recommended particularly suitable resort for children due to uh, changing weather conditions to harden them. Zhukovsky says that he has often convinced impatient mothers that they should go for walk with their children at any time of day, even when it's cold and rainy. The entertainment of the higher society and the French, German and English governesses became a thing of the past in the Baltic coastal resorts with the coming of the World War I. In the 1920s, when resort life resumed, nothing was like in the olden days. Empires collapsed and the aristocracy not longer set the tone of the resort. And with that, uh, the individual bathing hours were abolished. In the 1920s and 1930s, separate areas of the beach of Yurmala were dedicated to nude bathing at different times for ladies and for gentlemen, and different times for joint bathing in costumes. Young children, regardless of gender, uh, could be with their mothers in the lady hours, while other ones, as before, had to remain under supervision of either their mothers or father. Teenage boys often tried to satisfy their curiosity and go on dangerous expedition to the dunes. Policemen were on duty there to secretly look from the top of the dune at the naked ladies on the beach. The Latvian Children Friends Union uh, took over the opening of children's sanatoriums in Ugri, Bitternieki, Irtiani Manor, as well as in the so-called children's summer colonies in Yurmala, Malusiaste, which were intended for impoverished children. The children of the employees of Latvian Railway could relax in the summer sanatorium in Dubulti. In the 1930s, there were many summer residents in Yurmala who came from Sweden, Finland and Germany. 
because the resort with its shallow and sandy bay was considered very suitable for recreation with small children. A sunbathing became popular in 1930s. Children were advised to dress in short swimsuits or let themselves enjoy the sun and air baths completely naked, covered their heads with a straw or canvas hat. Children have appreciated the wet sand of the seashore in every era, with uh, which they could allow themselves to express their different talents by building castles, fortresses, and sand sculptures. A uh, 1930s guidebook of Jurmal specifically mentions this activity. A few words have to be said about dredging the coast. The main diggers are children of different ages. It is pleasure to watch what excitement and interest the little ones form all sorts of figures and buildings on the sand for hours. Such an activity is not forbidden to them because it exercises their mental abilities, develops their thinking and appreciation for beauty. There would be no objection to any of this. It only the small and large artists wouldn't forget to put sand back onto the excavations and formations when leaving their workplace and going home. This is what Jurmala, a pioneer republic. Uh, this is what Jurmala is referred uh, to as in Soviet era guidebooks for tourists. The first pioneer camps in Yurmala were opened in the summer of uh, 1945. In 1950, there were already 29 and 20,000 children spent their summers in them. The number of pioneer camps grew every year. Early, uh, every factory in Riga or a company or institution had its own pioneer camp for the children of their employees. The children could spend at least two weeks by the sea while being cared for and fed, while also being provided something similar to a cultural program, participation in various interest groups, field trips and cinema visits. Uh, but all of this was only disguised since the main task of these camps was the ideological upbringing of the newer generation. From the 1960s till the 1990s, uh, educational activities in the pioneer camps consistently prevailed over medical purposes. Uh, here are some memories from uh, pioneer summer. Uh, from boy named Agri Sanjans uh, in uh, uh, in future a teacher uh, in 19, uh, 1972. Uh, there were hand and foot washing devices or a long row of cast iron drums which are like a pin or rod uh, at the bottom through which water flows when they are lifted. Occasionally the additional bundle with pungent concentrated chlorine solution appeared. It was necessary to wash your hands before eating, absolutely not the face. That was checked upon. Uh, then they were rinsed for a long time in regular water. Uh, it all started with morning exercise, zaryatka, uh, from two uh, to three circles around the central square. After that, the whole camp was lined up in several rows and a guy with an accordion came, stood in front of us and played fun and uplifting music. Uh, while the young athletic boy from the Young Communist League demonstrated various exercises that we had to follow. Uh, this was followed by uh, washing ourselves in and doing our bedding. The bed had to be made very quickly and nicely. This was followed by solemn reception ritual. Uh, we waited by our beds while one of the leaders came to us. Sometimes we had to redo uh, the bedding three to five times. The others who were quick and careful didn't have breakfast and got drilled up, promised to knock us around. 
and they very often did so on the way to the canteen. The canteen was very hot and all the dishes were made from aluminium. After the meal, the group was recounted, joined in two rows and walked to the central square. The camp chief gave uh, an encouraging speech. Some pioneers who had done something particularly good the previous day were also named such as setting uh, up a bed very qu quickly and with good quality. Uh, these young heroes come forward and ran a circle of honor along with the other members of the camp uh, who applauded and greeted these chosen ones with loud applause. In addition to pioneers and the children of vacationers, there were other children in Soviet air resorts, sanatorium patients who tried to recover or improve their health in the resort. They were not only from Latvia, but also from other parts of the USSR. In 1980s, there were uh, 13 specialized children's sanatoriums in Latvia, most of which were concentrated in the resorts of Ugre, Stigulda and Jurmala. All summer holiday, uh, lovers who, uh, who come to Jurmala during the Soviet year Union sign to provide accommodation, meals and treatment, popularly called savages, looked for opportunities to rent a room or a bed by themselves, and often came to Jurmala with children. A very interesting process of integration between the children of summer vacationers and locals developed, in which various games, nursery rhymes, anecdotes and slang were tried out. Oftentimes, uh, the visitors made long-term contacts with the room owners and the families visited that, uh, uh, there year after year. They played games with the children of the summer vacationers, went to the cinemas, beach and Luna park. Of course, the communication took place in uh, Russian, which the local children learned without any intensive training courses and teaching aids. Currently, uh, there is no specialized children's sanatorium in Jurmala today. There are still a lot of tourists with children. However, a children at the resort today is already a completely different story. Uh, the memories adults have of their childhood uh, shrouded in nostalgia and evoke thoughts of a lost paradise Similarly, the resort is also a desire to recreate a once lost paradise where you can feel like a child again, playing cheerfully, freely and being carefree, all the while forgetting even just for, even for just a moment about the relentlessness of time and the endless worries and problems of adult life. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Inga, for your presentation and thank you for sharing the wonderful photo with us. Um, do you have any comments or any questions, please? Unfortunately, we can't hear you if you are talking. <laughs> Is. Okay. Uh, if 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 uh, I I have a question actually, and um, my question is, um, you mentioned that uh, this exhibition child in resort, um, it is uh, we can see it in uh, Urmal Museum. Uh, have you thought about uh, adapting the content of exhibition and create a virtual uh, exhibition? Because at this moment when museums in Latvia are closed, it would be really useful and uh, uh, have you thought about virtual exhibition on this topic? Uh, if I understand you, you ask about the uh, possibility to uh, record the, the exhibition or something uh, in, in a digital way? Uh, in general, yes. Uh, have you have you um, have you thought about the uh, idea to uh, adapt the exhibition which we can see in Jurmal Museum?
to a virtual version, for example, that uh, everybody from uh, his house can, uh, can uh, just uh, look in the internet and look uh, um, and, and, and enjoy your virtual exhibition about child in the source. Mm -hmm. uh, the exhibition, uh, exhibition, the child in resort is our first step in this in this theme, because uh, the childhood history in resort it is a terra incognita for uh, whole museums in whole Europe. Uh, only Jurmala uh, City Museum and only the uh, Sopot Museum uh, have some experience in in this theme but uh, yes we we uh, think about this and we have a part digital in our digital exhibition uh, the, about the pioneer camps uh, but it is uh, it is possible to see when you attend our museum it is not uh, uh, possibly to see in uh, the mm, social media or somewhere in internet. It is, uh, it is future uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have any questions, any comments? If not, then uh, let's continue our session uh, with the, the next presentation. And the next presentation is delivered by uh, Joanna Voidon uh, from University of Oslo, Poland, and her presentation is Childhood in the Reading Primus from the Soviet bloc from 1949 to 1989. Uh, please, Joanna, the screen is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me and can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so um, this presentation is not work in progress. In fact, it's, ba it's based on the research already published. And I would like to present just part of it. Um, um, before the break, we were talking about some strange interests. So my strange interest is uh, reading primers, and I um, use them in various um, other projects as a kind of a side project. But Eventually, they also began part of the large project or topic of a large project published first in Polish in this book on the left and quite recently in English by Routledge. The main difference between the two books is that the Polish one has lots of pictures from the reading primers, while the right hand one has no pictures. But this presentation will be mostly uh, based on pictures. Uh, so, as we can imagine, children were the main protagonists of the reading primers, uh, with the young readers being the main target uh, audience, the little characters were bringing the world of the primer closer to the world known to the reader. And as in many other aspects, the question arises as to what uh, extent the primers reflected the real world and to what extent they aimed to shape it showing not so much the real as the desired situations, behaviors, activities, uh, or attitudes. So uh, some, some general observations from the analysis of uh, the primers, I used the primers of, the, um, um, of most of the countries of the Soviet bloc uh, uh, in Europe, and you will see the signatures um, uh, indicating uh, the letters um, indicating and uh, the dates uh, from which uh, primer a certain picture comes. Mm. So first observation, children's out of school life was a collective life and hardly ever um, did the children spend time alone. Uh, the Russian researcher of the Books um, of those books, the late Vitaly Bezrogov pointed out that individual protagonists were completely excluded from the Soviet primers. Uh, the protagonists were always part of a collective. And he was struck by the individualism in Polish illustration, for example, a girl, Ala, sitting by herself in the room. And he noticed it as a fundamental difference between the Soviet Union and the satellite countries. But in the primers from other countries of the Soviet bloc, like in this Slovakian um, primer, the children 
also either played, worked or performed duties in the company of siblings, colleagues and possibly parents or caretakers. Um, no matter what they did, um, they did it collectively. And there were reading passages that directly reprimanded those who avoided company, uh, especially if children did not want to share toys or school supplies. The punishment it's in such cases was usually exclusion from the collective. Doran, a good pupil uh, on the picture um, in the upper left corner, uh, got a ball for his birthday and wanted to play uh, with it only with one friend, but not with another than both friends left and Doran was left all alone with his precious gift. Um, role models in turn were three classmates who are companions. Um, they learn and play together, who adopted a dog together uh, and took care of it, or two friends who made a model airplane and then played with it together again. And uh, as you can see on this picture uh, and on some others uh, as well, children in socialist primaries spent most of their time usefully through their own free will or from a sense of duty or as a result of someone else's instruction. Um, and so uh, here uh, the combination of the educational function and probably not always fully conscious documentation of reality can be observed. For example, in this Polish book where boys brought water from the well to an elderly man who apparently had no access to running water, but this issue was not discussed in the book. Uh, the household course of the children may also have reflected reality. The most common tasks were watering pot and garden flowers, grazing or feeding domestic animals, uh, hens, cats, but also calves or piglets or birds in the winter time. Sometimes the youngest members of the household um, helped with more serious work in the field, garden, park, orchard or farmyard. At the beginning of um, the primer, they often participated in the fruit harvest in the orchard, which corresponded uh, with the to the realities of early autumn when the school year begins. And in Bulgaria, Rom Romania and Yugoslavia, the grape harvest as well. Many course corresponded to common beliefs about what children could or should do, like carrying coal or wood uh, with older boys also helped. So helping to prepare meals or laying the table bringing food, washing or drying dishes, washing or sweeping the floor, shopping, sending letters, reading to younger siblings, polishing shoes. Others presumably reflected the rural realities of the time, for example, bringing lunch to a father working in a field like this boy here on the left. And um, Alenka in Czech and Slovenian uh, primer did not, uh, did, uh, I think Slovak primer, did not want to go to her aunt uh, if she was not going to return home before the evening because when she, then she was supposed to bring slippers to her father who was tired after his day's work. It was her duty. There were also more ambitious tasks such as cleaning and sealing windows, assisting in the construction of a board fence uh, or clearing snow from the road. Uh, one of the Slovak reading passages treated participation in household courts as a measure of Masha's adulthood. Another one found in a Ser uh, Serbian primer, but translated from Russian proved that cleaning uh, one's own shoes does not count as helping one's mother. The most hardworking children seem to be those from the 1965 Soviet Russian primer who were presented almost exclusively doing useful activities and individually a Polish girl named Agatka from 1954, who brings wood to the staff, fed the chicken, watched over the milk so that it did not boil over, weeded a garden patch, put the geese to grass, fed the cat and brought food to her father in the field. She also went to school every day and did her homework. Surprisingly, she also had time for fun. Uh, this reading passage, uh, with no pictures though, disappeared from subsequent editions of the primer, probably under the influence of critics who accused Elementash, so their reading primer, of overburdening its rural children with work which is reflected in the archival files. Uh, even children's recreation 
uh, often bring some benefit, if not for others, then at least for the participants themselves. The primaries taught how to spend time well, so the children took advantage of the surrounding nature. They went to the river or forest uh, when, where they not only played, but also observed plants, animal or natural phenomena. Sometimes they picked up berries, mushrooms, flowers or leaves, or brought some uh, brought home hedgehogs, which uh, they then bred at least until the spring. Um, they took care of plants or other animals, uh, sometimes adopted ones um, or just played with them. They caught fish, especially the boys, while girls and mother later cooked fish soup, especially in the Russian primaries. Uh, the attractions also included trips, camping, which could be a reward for good learning and good behavior, visiting someone, taking part it's in sports competitions. Sometimes these were just races, some were in the meadow, but sometimes on big stadiums, as well as welcoming guests at home. There were also visits to the zoo, cinema, theater, puppet theater. At home, children were engaged in DIY activities. They made and gave gifts to their parents, especially to mothers. They also read or listened to books read by adults and sometimes sat at their desks watching or drawing something or writing, uh, for example, a letter. A Serbian boy named Dragan kept a nature diary. Children could also play musical instrument, uh, organize theatrical performances. Um, the girls sewed clothes for their dolls or teddy bears. In the 1980s, children sometimes watched television, usually before bedtime. Uh, games and toys are very traditional. This is one of the striking features. Perhaps they reflected the reality, but sometimes one may have the impression that it was a reality from the childhood of the textbook authors, not of the readers. Uh, obviously, there are timeless games, such as Blind Man's Bluff, tag or hide and seek that we can see on the picture here. They included also tug of war, hopscotch, fancy dressing, blowing bubbles, um, playing football, cycling, riding a scooter. Seasonal games stand the ten tense test of time, like building sand castles on the beach or swimming in the river in the summertime. We'll see it later too. And uh, making a snowman, skating, skiing, slaying in the winter, the colder the country's climate, the more often winter was featured in the primers. And in Czech and so Soviet primers, playing hockey was also included. During other seasons, Girls played with a skyping rope and dolls. Yugoslavian dolls, um, girls often had a pushchair and Polish girls in the second half of the 1950s and um, had a doll's house. While boys played the, with paper boats or flew kites. The young characters had much fun owing to a new bicycle or a new bowl. Um, in fact, uh, swings, sandpits, carousels, um, slide had not really changed much for years, but um, did ring, uh, ring uh, roses or marbles or carrying each other in a wooden cart really correspond to the reality of the 1980s and how many children had uh, rocking horses and how many enjoyed catching butterflies in a net or bowling a hoop in a stick that you can see uh, here. Do they uh, play chess on a regular basis when they are six or seven? Interestingly, unlike in the Western European primers, children from behind the Iron Curtain never played the game of cowboys and Indians, which was quite popular in Western European primers. Um, it's um, worth considering whether primer toys perpetuate gender stereotypes, and I did not um, make systematic calculations, but basically it's girls who played with dolls and boys who played with cars, or imagined they were the army even though in the Albanian primer and in some Russian primers, girls were soldiers too. Uh, a Bulgarian uh, boy named Rasho was playing with building blocks when his sister came to boast of a new dress soon for her by their mother. And on this picture, you had two nice boxes and you can easily guess which one belongs to a girl and which one belongs to uh, a boy. A Russian girl... Um, do I have it here? No. A, a Russian girl uh, mimicked her mother while cooking. Oh, here she is. Uh, and next to her, there were three boys. One was sewing a board, the second catching fish, and the third drawing. 
for her seventh birthday, a Czech girl, Ola, got a bicycle from her father and a doll from her mother, as well as a spider from her aunt and a kiss from her sister. So it was the parents who gave gift according to uh, the gender stereotypes. However, there were also pictures in which it was a girl who pulled a train or built one from blocks while a boy was listening to fairy tales or all the children played together a game about a construction site or flew a plane. Um, Czech, girls in, uh, Czech children uh, enjoyed do-it-yourself activities together and complained to the father that the saw was blunt. A Russian boy together with a girl uh, made a wooden frame um, nevertheless, it's difficult to find examples in which boys would take part in traditionally girlish games, excluding Russian brothers who seized a doll from their sister and ran away with it into the garden. Some descriptions of games in Eastern European primers are characterized by their propaganda uh, overtone. For example, a group of children from GDR, from German Democratic Republic, played a game about the production cooperative, LPG. Dieter on a scooter, you could see him here, you can see him, him here, uh, was a tractor driver. Klaus on a three-wheeled bicycle was a truck driver. Jutta cooked for them all on a toy cooker and Jürgen was sitting by the phone allocating the tasks. While next to him, Berbel wrote something. In this way, they imitated the stereotypical adult also gender roles. Uh, like a uh, Bulgarian Petka who pretended to be a driver right, like his father. Uh, propaganda values may also be attributed to military games, um, popular especially in Russian primers, where the obligatory element of the outfit was um, a Budyonovka hat with a red star on it. But children usually only paraded and did not, unlike in the real game, shoot, take prisoners, etc. Uh, in the games presented in the primers, there was no enemy either, only our soldiers. But for instance, and I um, a young Albanian girl, uh, you can see her uh, on the right hand side, um, uh, yeah, uh, pointed her, uh, his gun, uh, sorry, a girl accompanied a, a, a boy who pointed his gun at an imaginary opponent. Was the decision to insert such a game a way to face reality since children were playing soldiers? And an attempt to civilize the game and show that a military game does not necessarily help to involve destroying the opponent, or perhaps it should be considered as an element of promoting a positive image of the army and bringing the army closer to the youngest members of the society. A clear propaganda character is recognized in the text which uh, expressed the care of the state for the fate of children. This was always emphasized while presenting the figures of party leaders caring for the youngest citizens. Um, as you can see in an Albanian primer as late as in the 1980s. And while characterizing the school which was treated as a, privil as a privilege of happy childhood. The text on the rights of all the children in the world um, to joy and happiness um, to, uh, and to life in peace published in the closing part of the primers were associated with the celebration of Children's Day. Ch childhood was shown in a cheerful and positive way, although not necessarily completely caref carefree. Children had, or at least should have had duties, tried to understand the world around them and prepared for responsible adulthood. However, in contrast to the West European primers, especially the newer ones since the 1970s, they did not experience any existential fears or long-term problems and were not bullied or discriminated against, nor did they experience any dilemmas, neither in primers nor in books for other older students. Unlike, for example, uh, the Western German primer protagonist who fought the temptation to steal a chocolate bar in the shop. The um, children from the Soviet bloc did not have any such dilemmas. Diana Pluk, uh, Plut, who compared pre-1989 American and Serbian primers, draws attention to the specific nature of the preparation for adulthood in communist primers. Serbian reading passages, unlike American ones, were not focused on the child itself as a person, nor on any personal problems that he or she might be trying to face. Children from Serbian books lived without the, sorry, with other problems, the affairs of the country, its security, 
threats and welfare with the primer being not a guide to children's developmental psychology, but to building their historical and ideological awareness. And this is what its socializing function was all about. This observation can be as well referred to other reading primers from the Soviet bloc. And do I have time to present this not so optimistic view? Yeah, okay. So from time to time, even in the books from behind the Iron Curtain, there were some less optimistic moments, although they were few in number and usually mitigated in some way. For example, in uh, the 1951 Russian primer, um, on the left-hand side, a boy had fallen down while playing football and looked very unhappy. In the next edition of the primer, however, the illustration was changed and it presented only happy players. And the text is exactly the same. The rest of the picture is the same. In the same books, there was a little girl painfully pegged by geese. An older girl was comforting her first, while in the 1980s, she just gave a stick to a little boy frightened, frightened by the geese so that he could chase them away. And it made the boy happy. Uh, children's falls and bruises um, were sometimes explained by the inattention or bravado of children. It was rare for primers to sympathize with the victims. A Russian boy, Vitya, whom you can see in the red um, suit, uh, laughed when his colleague Fedya skied into a snow drift and fell down. The author saw nothing inappropriate about it. Later, Fed Fedya shook the snow off. They went around the school together and returned home. The reading passage arrived at the conclusion, in winter, children have a lot of fun. Uh, an illness was sometimes portrayed as the result of recklessness or disobedience on the part of the children themselves because they had been drinking cold beverages or going for a walk in the rain. And the primers offered simple remedies when someone was injured, a friend or mother dressed the wound, when a rose thorn was stuck in the finger, it had to be removed. Children's painful teeth were extracted, but never cured by the dentist. This is quite strange. And the pain wore off. Other illnesses were short and quite mild, a runny nose that you can see, sore throat or earache. Mother took the temperature and administered medicines. In older primers, it was mentioned that the medicine tastes nasty, but in newer ones that it was effective. One of the Czech primer, uh, primers emphasized that mother got the medicine in a pharmacy free of charge, proof that the socialist state cared about its citizens. Sometimes a doctor came or friends only for company or to give help in catching up on school assignments. In general, children depicted uh, in Eastern European primers were healthy and fit, which could be interpreted as the result of good hygiene and prophylaxis. They were no chronic disease or children with disabilities, while in Western European primers, for example, a child in a wheelchair has been present, uh, present in almost every edition since the mid 1970s. The reflection by Anna Landautajka on the Polish primers is also relevant to the books from other countries of the Soviet bloc, that the characters did not get seriously ill or die, neither children nor adults. The subject of death was present only in the context, uh, context of war, and heroic soldiers, while, for example, Austrian children at the end of the 1940s, together with their mother, visited the grave of poor Heine. In later Austrian primers, as well as in German and Italian ones, one can find reading passages devoted to All Souls Day. The second context, uh, context that can be linked to the motive of death in Eastern Europe is the issue of orphans, and here you can see the orphanage. Um, they were relatively most frequently, although yet very rarely mentioned in Yugoslavia. Their depictions could be poignant, but usually with a positive message, the children found support in adults, a teacher or a friend mother, friend's mother who treated the orphan as her own child. The Russian brother, a primer presented in a very optimistic way an institutional solution to the problems of orphan, uh, orphans and orphanage. In this house, it's the citation, the children live in friendship. The house was built by the Soviet Union. Thank you, Soviet Union. It did happen in the primers, in addition to positive role models, I but quite rarely also feature, featured negative examples of children who did not follow the promoted principles that were and were rude or unreasonable. The theft of a fruit of fruit from the orchard um, deserved to be reprimanded. Here you can see, especially since the owner gave the fruit to other children and the perpetrator was ashamed. 
Slovenian mothers were not happy about the mess made as a result of children's games and the Polish teacher embarrassed an antek who had a hole in his socks and a dirty handkerchief. In general, the primary characters quickly acknowledged their best, uh, bad behavior and, for example, stopped playing the drum when the younger siblings were falling asleep or a sick neighbor was resting. The primary consequences of children's mistakes were not too painful. Even a disobedient Russian girl, Dasha, whom you can see here, who despite warnings leaned out of the boat to pick a water lily, fell into the water and began to drown but was caught by a friend who could swim well. Little serfs played the ball on the road and the ball fell under a car. They were instructed by the driver that they were not allowed to play on the road. In an East German primer, a reckless bicycle ride ended up with an upset, while in the Austrian primer, Peter or Peter, who was playing football in the street along with his friends and was hit by a car, had to stay in bed for a long time. Accident appeared in large numbers in West, Euro, uh, in West German textbooks, often presented in a drastic way, even with the open question of whether the victim sur survived. But it, won't, it was not in the socialist world, which was about, uh, above all, friendly, safe and good with pretty, healthy, fit and happy children. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wojda, uh, for your presentation. Do you have any comments or questions? I think we have time for one or two questions. Yes, Professor Ivo Tukestere, you're kindly to ask your question. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, it, it's ab uh, absolutely amazing uh, presentation. Thank you, Joanna, uh, for for this. I have both your uh, your books, also this Polish vers version. Uh, it, it, my question is actually, uh, have you looked in such a perspective as uh, open propaganda and hidden propaganda? in text uh, textbooks. Uh, yeah, they, uh, I, I will stop on, uh, on, on this, otherwise I will start to explain my, <laughs> my thoughts about this, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, moreover, I also found, um, well, how to answer <laughs> this complicated question shortly. Uh, my Initial idea was generally not to deal only with propaganda, but to see as uh, at the world of the reading primers as such. But then it turned out uh, that everything, in fact, can be regarded as propaganda. I mean, open propaganda is like Stalin with the kids or our slogans about the 1st of May or about the Soviet Union. But you also have a kind of a hidden propaganda when you have, for example, role models of parents, that uh, the parents are only have certain professions. And I checked it, um, the Polish version, I mean, I checked the Polish primers and the discussion on the Polish primers also in the archives of the censorship office and on the Minister of Education, Ministry of Education. And it turned out that not only all my intuitions were true, but even more. So, for example, there was a discussion in the 1950s about the father, one of the fathers of the textbook protagonist, and it was decided that he could not be an engineer because the father of the main protagonist had to be a worker, and only the father of a, uh, you know, of a supporting character could be an engineer, and that's a clear uh, propaganda uh, for me. Uh, also, parents. Um, Teachers were teachers, but no one's teacher, well, no one's parent was a teacher. No one's parent was a shop assistant. Shop assistant was standing in the shop, but a parent could be a worker in a factory, for example. And it was put there deliberately and it was checked very carefully. Uh, so um, like um, those um, household duties, even the way how the kids look like, you can see a field in a Romanian primer where children, school children help picking up harvest and they are wearing their pioneer scarves. Is it open propaganda or hidden? 
they are they are kind of shown in their natural environment but it turns out that there or there is a story about two, two boys who helped an older woman and it turns out it's mentioned in the text that they were pioneers so the story about is about be nice but who is nice not just boys but the pioneers but what was even more interesting i think for me were those um, open and um well, deliberate and hidden messages. I mean, like deliberately and in this propagandist way, everything was very nice and positive. But if you, uh, I don't know if you remember the picture with a boy bringing um, lunch to his father in the field, then all of a sudden you can see that the father, it's 1970s, is still using a horse um, in the field. And this is something that I don't think was... Um, really well thought. Sometimes those people from the ministry were kind of taking care also of the visual part. And for example, it was criticized that um, the house of the protagonists in the village uh, looked like a house, you know, of, uh, of a kulak. So he had a tractor, he had a brick uh, uh, house, and it did not correspond, well, it corresponded with the Polish reality of the Polish countryside of that time to a certain extent, but it did not correspond with the um, intended message of the reading primary. So it was also criticized. So, yeah, I could talk, you know, for hours about uh, the primaries. Well, I thank you. I see that uh, Maria has uh, raised her hand, please, for a comment and a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful. I have enjoyed it very, very much. And yeah. my question is a bit in the line of uh, Iveta. In all the uh, wonderful images that we have seen, at least I have seen three that are games of children, um, but uh, I, I don't know how it's called in English, but the, the children, they are holding hands and they are like in a circle. I know how it's called in Spanish. This is, in Spain, is a very traditional game, always played by girls in the past, always by girls. I have seen that in, in your images, one time are girls and the other time they are girls and boys. Well, in Spain, during the... Uh, the period of the Spanish Civil War in the 1936, in these areas that were rather dominated by the by the communists, by the Soviets, um, they were playing this game, but with a political uh, uh, orientation, because boys and girls they were together. Uh, sometimes they were um, lying down in the floor and they were making a communist star or it was a child in the middle and was uh, doing the communist alley. So it, the, at this moment, the, the game of the holding hands was getting a lot of hidden meanings. Uh, it could be also the peace, the unity, the solidarity. So my, there goes my question. Do you think that this particular uh, game, that is a game of children, it could have sometimes a, a kind of ideological meaning in your in, in your primers or, or other kind of games can have hidden meanings. It could be a kind of hidden propaganda. And thank you very much. And I suggest you also to do comparisons with the West to compare at the same moment the uh, images because that would be very, very interesting. I think it's, it's, it is very rich presentation. Thank you very much. So again, uh, it's a very big uh, issue of how to qualify some things as propaganda or not. And I'm struggling with it both in the reading primers research, but I also started, um, I did my PhD on propaganda in uh, textbooks for all the subjects in Poland in primary schools under communism. And they're also, you know, Sometimes it's hard really to decide. And I think that's the tricky thing. Um, and it's to a certain extent, it would be, I think, safer and more honest to say that, yes, that uh, there was propaganda message in almost everything. And um, part in particular, the supervisors from the ministry and from the censorship office, 
they try they praised especially such aspects where those propaganda was not um too visible i mean you know if you just put a citation from marx let's say in um, physics reading primers then it can be easily skipped but if you put heavy industry into the task that you have to calculate something that then you cannot skip it so easily and so i believe that there were a lot where many layers of those propaganda messages, they tried to uh, what uh, Dorina, uh, Dorena said today, to create this new man and to completely brainwash um, those, those children. And I am also, uh, I must say, not sure if I was able to catch, you know, to get all those meanings, all those cultural um, issues that you mentioned. For example, in Poland, I am not aware of any ideological things in such a circle. But in Yugoslavia, it was it had uh, this ideological meaning because when the children were playing it, it was called Titovo Kolo, and it was said that they were go doing this, playing this game um, in praise uh, or in um, giving salute to Tito and they, there was a special pioneer song um, associated with this game. So it was using like a traditional game and giving it a new ideological meaning. But I'm not sure if it was the case in all the countries. In Poland, for sure not. But also in Poland, I, well, I was raised in the 19th 70s, 1980s, and I can assure you that we were not playing such a game on a daily basis. So it was the kind of an ancient, traditional, I don't know, for grown-ups, maybe my grandmother played such a game. Uh, I am not even sure about my, my parents. But, uh, and here comes the question about, uh, or an issue about interpretation and this comparative aspect. Um, I am aware that probably I was not able to get all the meanings, especially from foreign primers. In some cases, I asked help of some of my friends and colleagues. Um, for example, I even did not translate the Hungarian primer myself. I just was sitting with one of the Erasmus students and he translated it for me and explained as much as he could understand. So. Uh, so I feel a little bit safer. The same was done with the Romanian primer, but I'm not sure about, for example, German. Perhaps I skipped something. And as for the Western European primers, there were much more of them because in the, uh, in the Soviet bloc, there was one primer adopt, uh, accepted for each grade in a certain year. While in the Western Europe, you know, you had plenty of them, like seven Spanish primers, perhaps, uh, at least, well, I used what is collected in Georg Eckert Institute. Um, so it's not even the exhaustive um, in terms of the Western primers, but I really wanted to show also to make sure what is propaganda and what is not. So I basically went through all the Western primers as well, but there I mostly took uh, paid attention on the thing that I thought had some um, more political meaning. So like um, how the state is presented, whether there were maps, whether there were flags, how school looked like, but not so much on everyday life because it would be really too much. So I had also some pictures from the Western countries um, that could be used for comparison, but I did not include it into this presentation. It's still... Um, had uh, you know too many uh, slides plus there is also that's why it's not published in R Routledge there is also the copyright issue uh, you know the authors uh, of the primers may be still alive and you have to wait 70 years until uh, from their death so it's it's uh, a big problem to to use this picture but I have some basis for research and I hope that maybe it can be continued either on a comparative um, way or, or in another way. Thank you, Professor Wolgan, for your presentation again. Um, yeah, I think, yes, I, I thank you very much. I thank all the presenters and all the participants for productive work in this session. Um, I kindly remind you that the conference continues uh, tomorrow. We start 
at 10 o'clock uh, on Riga time. Um, are, are there anything you want to add, Professor Riga Kester? Uh, yes, I just would like to thank you everybody for these wonderful presentations today and we are looking forward tomorrow uh, to, to listen to uh, Christoph, to listen to Lina uh, and uh, Linda Daniela unfortunately is not here today because she is dean of our faculty and can you imagine how uh, she is overloaded with this corona situation uh, and I will have tomorrow a special guest guest for, uh, for us, uh, Tuom Zarinj, who will present just for uh, us, I mean, uh, just for this, uh, uh, for, for uh, our scope, because he will speak about new <coughs> movie, and therefore it is not uh, yeah, uh, possible to, to show her, uh, his presentation to wider uh, audience. Yeah. Uh, due to legal rights again. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a nice evening. I regret so much because normally we are going now to National Museum to special guided tour prepared already half a year ago. Then we would go to very, uh, very good restaurant, I assure you, and take nice dinner together. So. Uh, now we, uh, we are going lonely to take our one glass of wine uh, and hope for uh, better times in the future. Again, thank you so much and see you to, uh, tomorrow.